Welcome to your New Trail Town Council meeting for Tuesday, September 22nd, 2020. This time I'd like to call this meeting to order and ask everyone to please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. Please remain standing for a moment of silence and take into mind if we have uh, a remembrance of Supreme Court Justice Ginsburg. Thank you. You may be seated. Yeah, just text them. At this time, as there's no additions or deletions to the agenda, I will need a motion to approve the agenda. So moved. Mr. Morris made the motion. All in favor? Let the record stand. It was unanimous. And also for the record, uh, Mayor Bertem McIntyre has not yet arrived. Okay, so that moves us on to presentations. There's a couple of proclamations to read and we will start with domestic violence proclamation okay you bear with me whereas domestic violence affects all Union County residents and far too many people suffer abuse at the hands of a spouse partner parent child or sibling these victims can be of any age race religion or economic status and the resulting damage is inflicted not only on the victims, but their children, families, and communities. Whereas domestic violence includes not only physical, but also mental abuse, emotional abuse, financial abuse, sexual abuse, and isolation. Whereas domestic violence is widespread, affecting one in four families and costing Union County annually over $11.6 million. Whereas according to the North Carolina Coalition Against Domestic Violence, there have been 1,369 women, men, and children murdered as a result of domestic violence since January 1st, 2002 in North Carolina. Whereas according to the North Carolina Council for Women, domestic violence programs across the state responded to 113,000 crisis calls and provided services to over 60,000 victims last year. Whereas the key to prevention is education, community awareness, having zero tolerance for domestic violence and requiring accountability by the abuser. And whereas Union County recognizes the importance of having collaborations by multiple partners to promote the social norms, policies, and laws that support gender equality and foster intimate partnerships based on mutual respect, equality, and trust. And now therefore be it resolved that I, Michael L. Alvarez, Mayor of the Town of Indian Trail, do hereby proclaim October 2020 as Domestic Violence Awareness Month in Union County and urge all citizens to support this observance, I further urge our citizens to increase their awareness and education of this destructive force, which deeply affects a large number of families in our state each year, and to become part of the efforts to stop violence in families. In witness thereof, I hereby, I hereunto set my hand and cause the state, the seal of this town of Indian Trail to be affixed on this 22nd day of September, 2020. I also have Constitution Week. Whereas the Constitution of the United States of America, the guardian of our liberties, embodies the principles of limited government in a republic dedicated to rule by law. And whereas September 17, 2020 marks the 233rd anniversary of the drafting of the Constitution of the United States of America by the Constitutional Convention, and whereas it is fitting and proper to accord official recognition to this magnificent document and its memorable anniversary, and to the patriotic celebrations which will commemorate it. And whereas Public Law 915 guarantees the issuing of a proclamation each year by the President of the United States designated September 17th through the 23rd as Constitution Week. Now therefore, I, Michael L. Alvarez, by the virtue of the authority vested in me as Mayor of the Town of Indian Trail, do hereby proclaim the week of September 17th through the 3rd, 23rd, 2020, as Constitution Week, and ask the citizens 
to reaffirm the ideals the framers of the Constitution had in 1787 by vig vigilantly protecting the freedoms guaranteed to us through this guardian of our liberties. In witness thereof, I have unto set my hand and caused the seal of the town of Indian Trail to be affixed this 22nd day of September in the year of our Lord, 2020. Dun, dun, dun. That brings us to the ABC board presentation. I believe Mr. Cohn. Actually, it's not me. me? It's not you. It is. It's uh, Jim, Mr. Jim. Uh, Jim White, Mr. White. Okay. The, uh, the representative, Mr. West Henson. Mr. Henson, no. welcome, Wes. Welcome, Jim. Hi. Mr. Mayor, Mr. Council members, um, we're here to provide the. Um, Indy Trail Town Council an update with the store uh, developments of the new freestanding ABC store. I had emailed a um, written memorandum and request uh, to memorialize what we were here tonight to provide you to each of you on, on council and uh, staff. I don't know if that each of you has the opportunity to check your emails every day before these meetings. It would come sometime this afternoon. If you did not, I have a copy for you. So if anyone does not have one and would like one for the record, I can provide that. Thank you. Uh, we have one actually. We, we do have one. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's an offer. And so it's with uh, great pleasure that I'm here tonight um, to talk about the status of the new store. Um, you may recall from an update earlier in the year where uh, we had selected the site for the freestanding ABC store, which is on a roughly 1.3 acre site on Old Monroe Road in the Sun Valley Entertainment District across the street from uh, Sun Valley Commons in the movie theater. Um, it's 6400 Old Monroe Road. Um, we have uh, progressed since that date uh, full steam ahead to architecturally um, to engage architectural services for the design of the store for site engineering services to um, engineer the site for the placement of the store um, through interior upfit and design down to shelving uh, displays um, you know we're fortunate that in this time where we're finally in a financial position to move forward um, with a freestanding store um, during a pandemic. One of the few, there's been a lot of businesses that have suffered, but one of those that has not is uh, alcohol sales. Uh, I feel like once COVID's over and we all have to go back to physical work, there's going to be a lot of people buying vodka for midday breaks because I think alcohol sales in our store are up probably 150% year to date, which is pretty amazing. Um, staff has worked and that's with that's in the middle of an E. coli outbreak that's in the middle of a pandemic that's with reduced store hours social distancing limitations on number of customers in store um, they've really just uh, done an amazing job uh, with the management and operation of that store um, so much that for the 2019 fiscal year we actually have a surplus of funds so one of the things that um, ABC boards necessarily need to do to the organizing or the authority boards for these um, stores and boards is that at any time there is a surplus over our required uh, reserves for operational side, we need to approach the authorizing body, which is this town council, to request approval to retain funds if they're not going to be um, dispersed to the town. In this instance, some extremely happy to represent to you that for 2019 through 2020 fiscal year, which for us ended June 30th, we've got $237,536 in surplus funds. Um, that board has been, uh, I think, an amazing asset for the town uh, from its inception to now. It's been one of the top performing stores in the entire North Carolina ABC system. Uh, and so that's what's brought us to the, the events of the day, which is to move forward with the vertical construction of a roughly 7,550 square foot retail store. Um, so I'm here today to provide you an update of where we are, to provide a time frame for when you can expect these next steps to happen, and then to request 
of you uh, to permit the ABC board to retain those funds uh, into a designated capital improvements reserve. So anytime, not unlike any other private uh, construction project, you look for a, a financial partner, and this ABC board is First Citizens Bank. First Citizens Bank gave us, speaking historically, three loans at the inception of this board um, on a wing and a prayer of uh, performance of stores across the state and, and based on relationships with that bank and they're local and they, they can make decisions locally, but they provided, you know, they provided the upfit allowance for the store where we currently are to the tune of a few hundred thousand dollars. They provided uh, the financing of about $200,000 of inventory um, and they provided bonds for um, for security in lieu of security deposits for the lease space, things that again are, aren't able to collateralize with things that they could then reduce and sell in the event we didn't perform. And so this board, uh, again speaking historically, paid off those loans in record time, uh, which would be the goal with this store loan. Um, so First Citizens Bank has provided us loan approval, uh, conditional approval. We're going through the final audit right now that will that will give them the underwriting documents to be able to finalize our loan um, and so in like in any construction project you've got to have a certain amount of equity into that loan into that project and then then the rest is in bank financing so that's the purpose of being here today is to request that um, no more than two hundred fifty thousand dollars be set aside in a capital improvements reserve for the purpose of completing that project uh, in that memorandum, uh, I detailed that um, we've put the, once the architectural plans were prepared, and that's an entire sheet of plans, so um, site plans, building designs, HVAC, plumbing, electrical, all sheets of plans were produced uh, for a sealed bid process. We received seven sealed bids from reputable contractors for turnkey site development construction. Um, that list was then trimmed to a top three uh, and then going back with those contractors to make sure that it's an apples to apples to apples comparison and that everything in each bid was included. Um, and now we have that list narrowed to three and are prepared to make a selection of that contractor. I anticipate that being done in the next seven days. Um, we have full permits in hand for the site to start development and construction, signs one permit. We are waiting a grading permit come back from the state um, for a sunflower study. We have had actually, this will be the third submission uh, on this sunflower study and expect it to come back approved anytime in the next two weeks. Um, that will allow us to move forward to close and to break ground. Uh, anticipate this store being, uh, holding a big pair of golden scissors, cutting a ribbon sometime, maybe end of second quarter 2021. Um, you know, based on the, the profitability of this store, we're now the, the most profitable in terms of gross revenues and net profits. I say profits, it's a nonprofit business, but to provide funds to the town, we're the number one performing one in, the, in Union County. We're one of the top performing ones in the state in terms of single store boards, but we surpassed Monroe, which is a long standing store. Um, with a larger geographic area, probably uh, three, um, maybe three quarters ago. Actually, maybe it was in 2020, but we haven't looked back from that time forward. So uh, what you have the benefit of is an amazing asset for the town today and going forward. Um, certainly if you have any questions, uh, I also should say we're, the timing of this couldn't be better. Not only do we have record sales to produce this surplus of funds, which gives us the equity piece we need to move forward with the store, we're also uh, in a period of what's the lowest interest rates for loans that we've ever seen, at least in my lifetime, 47 years on the planet. So it's an amazing opportunity. Um, and if anyone has any questions, happy to answer those questions to get a little more granular detailed if you'd like for me to. But again, this is basically just a informational uh, session to provide you guys an update and to request that um, you would approve us setting aside those funds for specifically that capital improvements reserve. If for whatever reason those funds uh, weren't spent, 
then the ABC board would commit to dispersing any excess funds back to the town no later than December 31st, 2021. Any questions? Uh, I've got a couple. Um, <clears throat> so what happens if the board doesn't approve the 250000 Well, what that would do, that would impact our loan-to-value ratio. So we would presumably have to borrow more money, um, and these are, you know, there, there aren't governmental loans for this type of thing. This is an arm-length commercial loan with a commercial bank. Uh, we would be forced to borrow more money and pay that back over time at an interest rate. So what would be um, giving the town um, cash today would cost the town over time. Uh, it would make the bank more profitable over time, but it would have an interest rate established to it so that it would just take us longer to get out from under a bank loan to be able to really provide funds to the town. Yeah. I mean, there's projections inside of, I mean, once this loan's paid off, you, you're going to have a store that generates Whew, three quarters of a million, maybe a million dollars to the town on an annual basis, and that's that's assuming current, that's assuming current numbers. It's not not even taking consideration future growth. Uh, what is a sunflower study? A sunflower study is a, a sunflower. This particular sunflower is kind of like the hill splitter clam. Uh, if you're familiar with those. It's an endangered species. It is a sunflower that grows at its tallest height about six inches. So it's closer to a dandelion than a sunflower. And if your site has any sunflowers of this endangered species on it, you would have to mitigate that in one of a few ways. You could pay a mitigation fee, you could uh, design around them, or you could uh, replant them somewhere else. Uh, what is the, the current operational reserves? Do we know? Our current operational reserves um, statutorily are th three months of operational expenses. And last year, the contributions uh, back from the ABC to the town was was that three percent? Is that? Do, um, does anybody know? Does anybody I recall? Have the total of what they, what they okay, paid. that'll work. Yeah. Uh, three hundred forty-five thousand dollars. And if um, we approve this 250000 capital reserve fund, what will that do going forward next year to the contributions to the town? Well, again, anything that we're not paying, a loan payment is an expense that comes off the bottom line. So the distributions to the town are of profits, which is gross revenues, less expenses. So to the extent we don't have $250,000 of loan, additional loan, to pay a bank back, we would do, be dispersing that same 250 to the town. With the 250,000 capital reserve funds, let's say the council mm -hmm. establishes that, what do we expect as the town as far as revenues coming from the ABC? Well, again, that's a function of profits. So you said 3%. If the number is, um, you said 350. What did you say? 345. 345. So that, that's based on sales for the trailing or for the, that, for the last uh, year in which those distributions would come. That would be almost 9%. That'd be about 8.7%, actually. So we disperse, um, we disperse a 3% a or a, a fixed figure because alcohol sales are seasonal. They're like a, a lot of things that have a peak season and a, and a slow season. So generally speaking, in the past, you would see uh, an ABC store do... 35% of sales in November and December from like Halloween through Thanksgiving into Christmas was a boon. Um, they tend to go down in the summer and go up in the winter. So I think that this board historically has done a set percentage of uh, distributions to the town on a quarterly basis, which is required with an annual true up at the end once the audit's known. And again, that's to 
that's to iron out the fact that um, it's sort of a, a, a business that expands and contracts over the course of the year. Your operational expenses stay the same, but your revenues go up and down depending on what time of year. Because I'm a little slow. So, um, so if I see 345000 that was this year, mm -hmm. distributed to the town, mm -hmm. and basically am I, am I looking at taking two fifty off of that, and if I'm just doing simple guesstim guesstimation, we're looking at 95000 then going to the town next year? No, that would that two fifty we're requesting is in excess of that three forty five. It would not be subtracted from it. That's what I wanted to be clear on. Yeah, we're not asking for it back. We have it to disperse. Our audit runs on a fiscal year again that ends June 30th. So to produce our audit um, to both you folks as well as the state ABC commission, uh, we need to have approval from you on this overage to be able to finalize that audit. But yeah, that would be in addition to, not in, in subtraction of. Any Thank other you questions? very much. Mm -hmm. Todd, Todd, do you have a question? I guess more just a confirmation is uh, I think we checked with the state and that the overage is we're okay with a motion of being able to take this money and put it into this capital investment reserve fund. So I just want to confirm that we've researched this and, and, it's, and it's good. Correct. So the way that the method by which the ABC board can hold a capital reserve fund is through the permission of the appointing authority. So they cannot keep this money unless you guys give them permission to do that. Um, and we have, um, I've received the memo from the ABC board today and the concerns that I had addressed or that I had, I believe they've covered in here, particularly if they don't build the building, we get the money dispersed. Um, and that they have, pin, they have selected a specific building project. Um, and that is uh, again, in par part of this uh, memorandum. So I do not have legal concerns um, okay. based on the request they gave. So we're today. clear to go with the motion. Okay. We would be clear to go with the motion. Thank you. Anyone else? So the premise is essentially to really lower your borrowing costs and your repayments, right? That's right. The less loan you take, faster you pay off, the more that the excess or the, the profits um, come to the town. Comes to the town. Right. All right. Mike, did you have anything to say? No. David? No. There's nothing else to say. We'll need the motion as stated verbatim on your agenda. I'll make the motion then. Um, I'll make a motion to approve the <coughs> ABC Board of Indian Trails request to withhold no more than $250,000 to establish a capital reserve investment reserve fund for the purposes of acquisition, development, and construction of a new ABC store located at 6400 Old Monroe Road, subject to the description and terms as presented to the council in the request to retain funds. Mr. McIntyre has made the motion to approve. All in favor? I'm going to recuse myself. Okay. Um, uh, council, does Mr. Cohen have permission to recuse himself since he's the chairman of the ABC board? Yes. Yes. Is that a consensus? Mm. Okay, yes. he's recused. Again, raise your hand for approval. Let, let the record stand that the motion was unanimous with Mr. Cohn being recused. Thank you guys. Thanks so much for your support. Jim, did you, did you have anything to say or how do you sit there? Good to see you guys live and in person. Uh, like the jacket, by the way. Oh, well, thank you. Just trying to keep up with that. <laughs> have a good one. Thank you, Jim. That brings us to employee recognition, Mr. Hutzinger. <clears throat> Uh, Council Mayor, uh, unfortunately, I got some bad news. We are actually uh, losing a very uh, valuable asset at the town. Uh, Mr. Dalton Pierce is leaving us to be a uh, new town manager for Blacksburg, South Carolina. And so we wanted to take this time and opportunity to uh, uh, show him appreciation for all the work he's done. He's been here for about five years now. Uh, again, he's, uh, he's done a lot for us. He's kind of our... It's kind of what I've said. He's a jack of all trades. He does a lot for for the engineering department, and so just wanted to take time to show our appreciation. So I think we have a certificate to give him. And if you don't mind, he'd like to say a couple words. Yeah. Sure. All right. Good evening, 
council, mayor. Uh, just want to say thank you so much for the opportunities, uh, getting to work with those in the community and you all behind the dais and everybody to my right and left. Uh, I've had an opportunity to speak with Mr. McLaurin and uh, he's been able to provide some guidance for me and my adventure I'm about to partake. And, uh, you know, it's been great. Uh, definitely having finished my master's and then parlaying that into a doctorate program right now. So I'm looking forward to that in my adventure, but my time here, I've thoroughly enjoyed it. And Mr. Hunt Singer has been nothing but professional to me. So I just wanted to show that appreciation to you all. Congratulations. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you very Dalton, much. I would like to say a few words. Mike, we'll start with you. Yeah. Dalton, congratulations. Uh, and looking forward to a, a long-term relationship that you will have with Blacksburg, South Carolina. Yes, sir. Thank you. Appreciate all you've done for us. Marcus? Yep. Congratulations. We are going to miss you, but we're also happy for you that you got, you got an opportunity that you get a chance to pursue. Yes, sir. So congrats. Thank you. David? We're lucky to have you. Yes, sir. You have to come up and, and play golf with us anyway when we uh, Absolutely. Have the golf Absolutely. Congratulations. Gary? Yeah. Con 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 excuse me. Congratulations and um, and good luck to you in your future endeavors. Yes, sir. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Congratulations. Yes, sir. Dalton, wishing you many blessings in your new job. Yes, sir. I appreciate Congratulations. it. Congratulations. You've worked hard. You've earned it. It's been an, very much an honor to work with you. Uh, please, if you remember, take the time to keep us, keep in touch with us over the, over the years. Ab absolutely. If you just jump right inside the state line on 85, if you get to the Peachinoid, I'm just a little north of that, only 10 miles from the new casino in Kings Mountain, so <laughs> definitely stop on in. <laughs> He's already promoting. <laughs> Mayor Alvarez. Todd, did you want to give him his certificate? Um, I don't know. Or, oh, do I have it? Yes, you have it. Oh. Do you need a hand? I, I might need one, Marcus. It's never going to get old, man. Come on. It's never gonna I don't have get a wooden plaque. Oh. Yeah. I do have several of them. It's too heavy. We brought Quinn back just to help him. Quinn, you got to help him, okay? Might say I'm his right hand man. You're his right hand. Left hand right now. <laughs> oh, thank you. Oh, that's right. That was your right thank hand. You. All right, that brings us to Commissioner Helms for an update from the county. Remember, 30 seconds. <laughs> as long as I can have a Union County 30 seconds, okay? There you go. I appreciate the opportunity to be here with you tonight. It's very special for me because the earliest memories I have as a child was playing in a yard in a little block house next to Omega Restaurant. And then we moved up the street across from the rock store, and that's where I learned to ride a bicycle. So Union County and Indian Trail, and specifically, is very special to me. Uh, last year when I, uh, I was the chairman, we had the privilege of hiring a new county manager. And when we hired that county manager, uh, the first instruction we gave him was that you need to develop relationship with the municipalities because we need to all function as one and work together. And I know on his first day as county manager, he was here uh, meeting with your town manager. And we want to continue that relationship. It's been a pleasure working with you. We've had an interesting time. This pandemic has been a challenge for all of us. But I think you need to be congratulated as well as our staff. I brought Brian Matthews with me. He's going to keep me honest on some of my numbers. Uh, but, you know, we went through that pandemic and totally supported our citizens. We took care of all the functions that were responsibility as, as well as y'all. And, but, you know, I have to look back, 2020 is, it's got a, and it's almost disappeared with this pandemic. In 2019, we had one of the most successful economic development years in, in the county's, county's history. And together, working together with municipalities and the county, we can continue that growth. I think we're going to come out of this pandemic in good shape. I'd like to talk to you, tell you a little bit about some of the progress we've made recently. Uh, we, we've broken ground on a new agricultural facility that is behind the Ag Center, and it's an equestrian. It's got an arena, and you know, Union County is one of the top three equestrian counties in the state. 
So it'll, it'll offer opportunities for all of our citizens. I'm really excited about this next one in that October 1st, we break ground, or we uh, have the dedication on the Norwood water intake for the Adkin water supply that will be bringing water to us. October 7th, we break, we have the same dedication and groundbreaking for uh, the water treatment plant that will be just this side of New Salem. The uh, thing about that is, is those two items will provide Union County water for, for the next 50 to 75 years or longer. Union County doesn't have a natural water source, so it's important. You know, we have the Catawba. We, we utilize the Catawba. The nice thing about it, you know, if we lose the Catawba right now, we lose water. But when we have the Yadkin, we'll be able to back one another up. And I think that's a smart thing for us to do. So that's, that's proceeding along. And, you know, we hope to have that finished 2023 to 2024 uh, time frame. So we've, we're moving along with that. Uh, October 13th, we have a uh, groundbreaking for a uh, administration building for the Sheriff's Department. They gave me a, tier, a tour a couple of years ago of the Sheriff's Department. They took me in the evidence room. But uh, they wanted me to sign a waiver that walking in there because it's hazardous health, things were stacked so bad. So they're in dire need of more space. And uh, we'll, we'll break ground on that October 13th. And then we've got in design, we'll have a 911 center that we're targeting to build over near the DHS building and uh, that we're expanding our 911 and EMS uh, capabilities so we can better serve Union County. I feel like that, that's real important because our county is going to only continue to grow. And uh, matter of fact, one of the things when I talk about, when I talk about our growth, we have to have responsible growth. You know, everybody wants to come to Union County. So we've got, uh, we've got, you know, we've we got to be responsible in how we move for, forward. And this can only be accomplished through all of our municipalities, and correct me if I say something wrong, Brian, uh, and, and, and the county. Several items, and I, I mean, you know, I know I'm talking to the choir, and a lot of this is new to you. I mean, not new to you. But, uh, you know, roads. Michael and I were talking the other day, Monroe Road's probably 2030 now. It should have been done five years ago. So, you know, that's a challenge for us. But one of the, one of the challenges that, that a lot of people aren't aware of, especially, and I'm focusing on Indian Trail right now, is the uh, water sewer infrastructure. With our new water plan for the Yadkin, that, that'll take care of it. We'll have, we'll have water. Uh, however, sewer's our challenge. And we've got, uh, you know, in 2010, we had a little over 200,000 residents in Union County. 2020, it's approaching a little over 240,000, about 17% growth. Now, actual sewer customers, uh, in 2014, I just, I mean, the numbers were available to me. We had 30,901 customers. 2019, we got 36,000 plus, and that's about a 16.5% growth. So we're growing, and sewer is a factor that can, can prevent growth, so we don't want to get in that, in that situation. Our Catawba water, right now you're drinking Catawba water. Catawba water is, uh, we're allowed to push 5 million gallons over that basin from the Catawba end of the Yadkin. We're actually pushing 25 and 8 million. But they give us an option how to do that. We can mitigate that by pushing wastewater back into the Catawba that's treated and put back into the, into the system. Therefore, we have to pump that wastewater back. And, and that's one of the things that, that we have, we're watching very closely is uh, the Poplin Pump Station. And the Poplin Pump Station is permitted for 1.5 million gallons a day. And right now the average daily is a, over 1.07 million gallons. 
but what we got to take in consideration between what municipalities and the county have permitted, we have obligated another 4.43 million gallons. That takes us basically to our poplin, uh, our poplin max. And, and right now we've got a, a line that goes back over to 12 Mile Creek where we pump that. And that particular line right now, we're stressing its capabilities. So last night we finished approving improvements to the Poplin pump station, doing what we call an EQ tank and also a West Fork line that'll give us multiple lines that we can push that back across. So we did that last night, and it's, it's, it, we're, move, we're moving forward. So it, it, it's important, but it's going to take a year and a half to two years to, to complete those projects. So you got another factor, too, Crooked Creek. Crooked Creek is approaching 80%, and with you know the projected permits that have already been we're getting toward capacity. When we hit 90%, the state says stop. You gotta be building or you can't add another thing. Well, we're trying to, trying to mitigate that and that's what this new EQ tank and everything like that it does. The EQ tank will add about 800,000 gallons a day that we, can, that we can utilize. And basically what it does is, the pump can only pump so much, but it has peaks during the day that it, that it runs. So we'll, it'll allow us to, when there's a slow time in the middle of the day and there's no showers and people getting ready and everything, we'll be able to move more of that affluent. And during the middle of the night, we can move that affluent. So it's going give to us, give us some latitude, but it's constrained, is what I'll call it, capacity that we'll have to, we'll be moving forward on. But Currently, applications are being received, and, they're, and please correct me if I say this right, but they're being put on a waiting list. Because one of the things that, and, and I've learned this recently from Brian, he educates me, uh, that, you know, they have, a, they have a, uh, a value they apply to each permit, the type of permit and things like that. So, you know, we've, of that 800,000 that we'll gain from that EQ tank, we've got targeted about 500,000 right now that these applications will take care of. And I feel good he's nodding back there. <laughs> and, but the thing about it is, is that if those houses don't use that prescribed amount, we may end up with a little more. But we don't know. And we had a conversation last night about, you know, we want, and I use the example because I think Indian Trail's ripe for somebody to come in and say, you know, I want to build a South Park Mall down here. Something to be good for the town and good for the community. You may disagree with me on that, but anyway, but the thing about it is, is that this could constrain the ability to do that. So, you know, what I'm, I'm saying is we have to work together to make sure that we can move forward. And we're not stopping. But I don't want the last thing I want to do is be have to stop, and and I, I tell you what I know that in talking with Brian and others in the staff, your staff talks to our staff. It's it's probably the best I can remember it being in a long time. I want to make sure we're excited that you're here, uh, and uh, that we can continue that relationship. So uh, you know it, we're all Union County, and like I say, this is home. I. Uh, had some discussions the other day and they talked about how long you've been here and I said well over 74 years and uh, I'm proud of Union County and uh, we need to continue that what I'd like to leave you with is that unfortunately we're approaching a cliff and the only way we can avoid taking a county and and a municipality over this cliff is that we work together that our teamwork continues and I can tell you from our board, we're commit, committed to, uh, to work with you in all veins. The Board of Commissioners have said all along that, you know, health and safety are the most important things that we do. I mean, we've got the best law enforcement community in, in, in the state, and we're going to take care of them. 
and we're going to continue to work with our water and sewer to make sure we can support our citizens. And uh, hopefully I can continue to work with you. Uh, I'll, I'll commit that I'll do everything to make us both uh, move forward and what's in the best interest of the citizens of Union County. So I, I really appreciate the opportunity to be here. And uh, I thank you. I know I, I, have, I have the privilege of talking with uh, several of uh, the councilmen and the mayor on a regular, on a regular basis. And uh, I thank you for that. And I want to continue. I, I have notes kind of if, if it would help the clerk to, for your records. I'll be glad to leave them with you. And uh, so, but thank you very much. And uh, don't ever hesitate to call me. I uh, answer the phone, don't I? Yes, you do. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank Mr. Mayor, Brian, you do you have anything you need to add? Richard, you're yeah. not going to get off that easy. Oh, yeah. okay. No, 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 no. no. I, I, I do have a comment if I can. Yes. Uh, Mr. Helms, I, I want to say a few things. First of all, um, being here, every time that I've called any of you down at the county, you guys have always answered. If you are not available, you've always called back. And I do appreciate that. Okay. The, the way that we can help move Indian Trail Union County as a whole forward is by cooperation and collaboration. And I want to say that that is something that I've always experienced with the county commissioners, your staff. And we do appreciate that here. We're very happy that you're taking care of the best law enforcement in North Carolina. And I agree with you on that because these are some good fellows over yeah. there. Um, the other thing I want to say is that um, the update that you provided on Poplin, that's good news. And we know that there was some concern in terms of the capacity, but I'm happy that the county has gone through and addressed those in short time, which I appreciate. You know, I'm, the, hopefully the citizens will, will hear and read about this. But that's really good that you, the county is attuned to some of the issues that are affecting Union County as a whole, but in this case, Indian Trail and the Poplin area. So we do appreciate that. And it has been a pleasure to work with you. I know the council here, I'm going to speak for them, but they can speak for themselves. They're all committed to working with Union County, county commissioners and staff, to help get things done, even if it doesn't directly benefit Indian Trail. But um, I'm, I chose to come to Union County because of the low taxes and the good people. And I'm sorry, you, you're not getting me to move from here. I'm, I'm a Union County fellow. <laughs> well, I appreciate it. I, you know, I did, what I didn't point out is the last five years, Two years we lowered taxes. The other three we've maintained. All these, all this growth we've 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 controlled our spending and everything. Trying to be prudent and and, and conservative in our utilizing of the tax dollars. So you know taxes. I'll, I'll agree with you. Low taxes are good here in Union County. The people are a hell of a lot better than the taxes. Yes. You know. <laughs> it's, uh, did you have something to say? Yeah. Richard, thanks again for coming in and uh, speaking to us. Um, it's been a pleasure serving on the boards with you. Um, you mentioned about the, um, the Poplin Road pump station as well as the sewer plant and, and all over there. And then um, something about the permits are already about maxed out. So and then there was the little mention about maybe a South Park. So how does the county work with the municipality or with public works? to ensure that there's enough permits that if there was an industry that wanted to come to this area, and which would be good, I think, for us, that there is that capacity available to them and it's not, it, that the door's not shut before they even get here. Well, I had a conversation with a manager today and, and you know, we're, we're not out right now, you know, but we've got, we're permitted up. But uh, I talked about that 800,000 capability of that new EQ tank. And right now we've got booked about 500,000 of it if, when it comes to, and it, you know, they haven't hooked on yet, so we're not seeing that flow yet. But, you know, the other 300,000, I had a conversation, you know, we talked about not just, you know, South Park, I was being a little facetious, but, you know, we may need another school. And we are actively working to make sure that we don't run into a situation and, and planning. Now, you know, there's, there is, how do I say, there is considerations in design for another waste water treatment plant in the future. Now, it will be 8 to 10 years. Depending, yes, Depending on when you start, it will be eight to, ten, 8 to 10 years. Uh, that, you know, that's a consideration, too. We're working that, too. So we're not being idle and not, 
not trying to prepare for the future. But, you know, it's, we just, we need to, we need to communicate with one another. And I know that uh, Brian will tell you that he regularly communicates with your staff and uh, that we, we understand. But, you know, sometimes, and I'm speaking from a county perspective, sometimes our staff knows more than the commissioners do. <laughs> And, and but the thing about it is, is we need to, the more we share that information among ourselves, that uh, the better off we'll be. And, uh, you know, I, I, you know, one of the, like I said, uh, when I was chairman two times ago, you know, I set up that somebody's assigned to each one of your towns. And, and I'm assigned to Indian Trail. And it's an honor to be assigned to Indian Trail. I enjoy it. And so, you know, I want to succeed. I'm buying a piece of property now. It's not an Indian trail, but I can throw a rock and hit Indian trail ground. <laughs> we, we'd love to annex you. By oh, would you? <laughs> you told me that. <laughs> Land's being surveyed right now. So, uh, but uh, yeah, we, uh, we're anticipating that. You know, we're, we're looking at, uh, at uh, school. School's another issue too. I didn't mention that when I talked about roads, but you know, schools. I think we'll find it interesting after this pandemic what the schools are going to look like. And I know that your businesses, you know, your business, I know a lot of the business entities, especially a larger corporation, are evaluating how they're going, what they're going to look like. Because they found out, you know, business can go on and not sit in the big, in the big building. But uh, it'll take planning. It'll take us working together. And uh, that's that's... That's what I want to do. I can tell you, I, I'm always available. Doesn't matter what time of day it is. My wife will tell you my phone rings. Not quite around the clock, because 11 o'clock I turn it off. <laughs> but uh, it, uh, it's been a privilege working with you and a privilege to be here tonight and uh, talk about my home. So uh, any, is there any other Todd, questions? Do you have anything to add? The, um, well, thanks for coming. And uh, I think the county does a great job of law enforcement, schools. I'm proud to call Union County home, yeah. so the commissioners have done a good job. I think the Norwood project's a great deal. Uh, when I went down to the comprehensive plan, I noticed there was a proposal pretty much to do a big increase in the transportation budget side. And uh, I know on Indian Trail, we have the traffic issue and a lot mm -hmm. of people drive through from the county. I just wondered what y'all were earmarking maybe in that, I think, Art, you mentioned something about maybe y'all were increasing that to like five million in the budget, and uh, I was just wondering what y'all were earmarking. Maybe more public transportation, maybe helping out with roads, or. Well, remember I told you staff knows more than commissioners. Yeah, okay. So I just kind of kind of wonder what maybe. I think I could probably answer this a little bit better. So there there isn't a defined project list for that at this point. Uh, and again, this hasn't come to the commissioners for them to vote on, so they're going through the scenario planning for the comp plan. Uh, once the coordinating committee makes a recommendation, it'll come to commissioners. Commissioners will ultimately have to adopt that and then move forward. One of the suggestions of the plan is to seek some additional transportation funding in different methods. That could be a sales tax. That could be the county putting that out of their general fund. There's all kinds of ways that could be done. In the past, we've been very successful in funding road improvements, small road improvements. I'm not talking about Monroe Road. We can't right. come up with that kind of funding, 30, 50 million, we can't. Five million, 10 million projects, those are probably in our, in our wheelhouse. Um, but it, again, those are the things that we're gonna be looking for. The commissioner's gonna have to weigh in on well, how do you pay for that? Is that possible? Because everybody has their own wants and needs and transportation is just one on the list. So I, I can't give you a list of projects. I can just tell you that's something that we're gonna be exploring. Well, I just noted the big increase, so I think people will be happy about something being done. Mm -hmm. I will you. tell you that we, we um, the board was very supportive in giving us some seed money um, for grants, well I should grants, basically to assist in getting DOT to fund some projects for intersection improvements, those types of things. We were very successful um, with that program. Uh, I, I think we identified 16 different intersections improvements and we've today I believe done 14 of those. That's amazing and we'd like to continue that. 
and the commissioners have been supportive. We're hopeful they'll be supportive of that in the future. I'm not putting any pressure on them. <laughs> anyway. Thank well, you. you know. Thank you, Mr. Helms. Well, it's, Jerry knows I sat with Jerry on CARPO, and so I have a little different view of funding DOT. It's kind of, you know, I spent 30 years with IBM in one of the schools they taught me. Uh, be careful accepting other people's monkeys. And DOT is trying to pass us as many monkeys as we can get. And your Monroe Road is a prime example. And uh, so they're doing the same thing to us. You know, they only want to build roundabouts and super streets. And I'm not going to comment on that tonight because I, I want to be pleasant. <laughs> so. But yeah, the 2050 is, is my t as a matter of fact, I spoke to one of the participants in that committee on the way over here today and so uh, we'll be interested to see what their recommendations are and just like uh, when you have a consulting committee come to you they'll come they'll come in and make their recommendations then you you have to make your decision whether you you uh, agree totally but uh, we've got I'm, I'm hearing some very positive things out of our 2050 committee and it's it's kind of like uh, you know, we wanted to go out and hear what the public wants us to do. I think that's our job. Just like last night, we had a great meeting on that Confederate statue, and people came and shared their opinions. It was a very productive, a very pleasant and cordial exchange of a difference of opinions. Proves that Union County is far above the rhetoric in the rest of the country. We can, we can talk about our differences and hopefully come up with a uh, suitable solution that addresses the people's needs. David, did you have anything to add? Yeah, I, I just want to say, Richard, um, thank you for the update. And uh, you, you've always been a commissioner that sets great examples through your work ethic. I've seen you at the uh, CARPO meetings. I see you out working. Uh, and and uh, as a fellow politician, which I don't like to use the word politician, but as a fellow politician, I look up to you, and I always well, thank have. Thank you. Uh, I, and I, I, I appreciate all your hard work. Well, I appreciate it. I don't consider myself a politician. I'm not smart enough to be a politician, <laughs> and uh, I'm not going to play the games. You know, what you see is what you get. Uh, but uh, I love this county. I want to do everything I can. When I'm gone, I hope they said he tried his best to move the county forward, and that's all I want. Well, we so. appreciate you. Thank well, you. thank you, sir. I appreciate it. Mike, did you have anything to add? Just want to say, Richard, thanks for all that you do for Indian Trail. Appreciate it. You're quite welcome. I like your beard. I just shaved mine. My son got married. I told him I'd keep it till he got married, and I just shaved mine about a week ago, so <laughs> got rid of my COVID beard. Thank you very much. I appreciate thanks it. Thanks for coming. Yes, coming. Thank thanks you. for coming, Richard, and it's, it's truly over the, it's almost a decade now, um, it's been an honor working with you, and I hope to continue working it's, with it's you. It's my pleasure. I hope, uh, I hope we can continue work together. So uh, thanks a lot. Welcome. Marcus, I appreciate the yes, communication. Sir. So. Yes, Commissioner sir. Helms, did you have something for yes, me? Yes, I will. I'll... If you want to go back to what I said, I don't know how to keep the medicine. Yeah, that's the medicine. Okay. At this time, I will open the public com comments. Thank you for your interest in participating in the public comments portion of today's regular meeting of the Indian Trail Town Council. And please be aware that these meetings are recorded and can be heard by anyone through the internet. Comments are limited to three minutes per speaker. You may not give your three minutes to another speaker to increase that person's allotted time. Comments are to be directed at the entire council as a whole and not individuals. Mm. Citizens will be expected to be civil in their language and presentation and act within reasonable standards of courtesy. We ask the audience, as well as the speakers, to maintain order and decorum in your conduct throughout the public comment period. That being said, you may not engage in slander, name calling, personal attacks, or threatening or otherwise aggressive speech or behavior that I or council reasonably believe will imminently result in a disruption of the meeting. Finally, we ask you a simple favor. If you have a grievance, concern, or complaint relating to a specific town employee, we, sp we respectfully request that prior to airing that grievance, <coughs> Here during public comments, you first contact the town manager, the town attorney, or one of us on council with your concern. We respect your right to be heard, and we ask you to respect our town employees' rights to a fair hearing on your grievance. Um, this was written very low, so is that Rosemary Moore or Gate or Moore? Sorry, I couldn't. 
More? Sorry, I couldn't read it. Um, so, your name is? Mr. Luttrell. No, Mr. Luttrell, you want to go up? Okay. Yeah. I didn't see you behind the mask. <laughs> All right. Mr. Luttrell, go ahead. Good evening, Welcome. Council, Good evening. Mayor. Um, I guess the reason for me coming tonight was we're engaged in a code enforcement issue that adjoins our property, which the town has graciously last Tuesday um, came out and looked at the site, and I know they're working towards the code enforcement, but one thing that came out of that was um, not quite clear how the uh, town views the easements, um, which is, is related to this stormwater issue. And that, so there's a drain between my home and the Morris residence and in the rear of the property and it wasn't clear to me how we decided or what but they were saying it's private and i brought with me my plate map and my hope is that the council would review this document and read into record whether this is in fact as it lists on the plate map public storm drainage easement my hope is that we could establish that it is actually public because one of the opinions that I heard was that it's not public and that would contradict the plate map. So I'm asking that we review this. Well, no, you still have a few seconds. Okay. And then, and then lastly, we, we encourage the work that the code enforcement has done regarding, um, the issue of of our neighboring proper property um, I think it's under CE 202-00168 which is Francesco Mario Andalin property and the code enforcement successfully removed that business so I'm here also to thank the town for recognizing that issue and we look forward to working with them to get the rest of the problem taken care of so that's kind of why I came tonight. Thank you, Jim. Um, I'm assuming all three of you are here for the same. Yes. Was there anything you wanted to add to that and what he said or and come up and speak or are we, so you're done. You're done, Mr. Luttrell? Yes. Okay, I'm we're going to reset and we allow Ms. Rosemary to speak now. Good evening. Uh, can you yeah. pull the microphone you down and can you uh, just make sure you speak loud? Yes. Thank you. Good evening to everyone, and to the mayor and to Mr. Marcus and to each and every one of you all. I wanted to speak on the behalf of the uh, problem that we have in, in our community in the back of my home, I'm a little nervous. <laughs> in the back of my home, there's a property that's on the other side. I think it's Pioneer. And uh, there's a problem there where uh, all of their water is coming into my property. And it has caused a lot of damage there. And um, we wanted to have update on what they have discovered on Thursday, this past Thursday. We haven't heard anything as of yet. And we know that the uh, homeowner in the back of us was using that property for business. And it was zoned for residential. And um, I think that's cleared up somewhat. And also, we want to know what the town can do to help us. And um, once they give us the update on um, what this here homeowner in the back of us has caused us the problem, we want to know how it can be taken care of. 
you have anything to say? So that's all I have to say. Uh, I'm just a little upset about it because once you buy a home and uh, you find out later on down the road that this problem has occurred because of somebody doing something that they shouldn't have. So we wanted to know how, what, and when, and how this can be solved. And I want to thank Mr. Marcus for coming. And also, I think it was uh, Mr. Todd, if I'm not mistaken, wanted. Yes. Yes. Yes, you were there. So we just want to have update on that so we can know how to handle it in a decent manner. So I want to thank you. That's all I have to say. Can I please get your name? When it's council comments. Yeah. Thank you. Can I get her name, please? Oh, that is Rosemary Moore. Mrs. Rosemary Moore. Oh, yes. I'm sorry. My name is Rosemary Moore, and my home address is 3701 Elkway Indian Trail, North Carolina. Robert Moore? Yes, sir. Did you wish to take your three minutes, or what, did she cover everything? I'm not good at public speaking, but I would like to say this, that we moved. I heard a young man uh, before me, uh, the commissioner said that he was so proud of the, the town here that he grew up in, and he's uh, proud that it's carrying on. It's the legacy of, of a, good, a good town. I'm, I'm quite sure Indian Trail, Union County is a good county to live in and to live out the balance of my years. I have no uh, inklings of moving. I love it here in Union County. It's quiet uh, compared to Brooklyn, where I came from, where we came from. It's a beautiful place. We moved from Brightmoor subdivision that had 800 homes. So we were looking for a more quieter, a more peaceful neighborhood, and we found it here in Union County. The only trouble is, is with the, the flooding that's taken place. And it's kind of scary to me, even as a veteran, that slept in water, but it's scary to me to see water coming up to my door. And I'm here retired, and I want to live the balance of my life in peace. So I'm hoping that the problem could be resolved uh, quickly. Thank you. Thank you. Now is um, council feedback to public comments, Mr. McIntyre? Yeah, um, Mr. and Mrs. Moore, Mr. Luttrell, um, I want to thank you guys for coming to speak, right? And also, I want to thank you for meeting us out at your property next uh, last week. Um, in my email to you on Sunday, you do know that I wanted to follow up with you to sort of see if you had any feedback. I also spoke to Mr. Hunsinger as well. So. Everything that you've mentioned, even including my visit out to your homes, the council is aware. I did keep them in the loop because I want them to know what, what's going on. The manager um, here, um, Mr. McLaurin, along with Todd and Brandy and Adam, will respond to you with whatever they think is appropriate or needs to be done and so forth. If you do not hear, just let me know, but the thing is, I do know that they are very involved in trying to bring this to a successful resolution, and they will get in touch with you. But as citizens, I do, I do appreciate you guys coming out tonight and speaking to us about this particular issue, okay? Here in town, everybody on the council, staff included, anytime a citizen comes to the town, we do take those concerns very seriously. But thank you for coming. Anyone else have a comment? Oh, Mike. Yes. Uh, I don't know if this, does this work? Yep. Yeah, there it goes. Um, yes, we had a great visit out there. Lovely home, lovely neighborhood. The issue we have is we have some land higher than, than theirs. And so what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at that plat, ask the attorney to take a le legal reading on what the word public means and then we will send a report to the council and then follow up. But thank you for your leadership on that. Thank you. 
Okay. Thank you. Brings us to Captain James. Law enforcement update. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and Council. Mr. Cohn, good to see you seated back over there. Um, I laid a hand out there in front of you about a question that Mr. McIntyre had asked um, at the previous meeting. Uh, these stats are just, just on that Highway 74 corridor. And to kind of just not go through every one of them, but to kind of explain um, construction was going on in 15 and 16. 17, they were starting to open some of the turnabouts. 18 rolls around, they opened a couple of the intersections. Uh, 19 was when it was really starting to go into play. Mm -hmm. October, I came up here, and that's when we looked at the staffing plan and restructured those traffic guys and had those guys hit 74, not 74 corridor hard. And that's where you see the numbers drop during November, December. Um, and take that downturn until, these, or until January of 20 of this year. Those are a little bit skewed. And I, well, I don't want to say they're skewed, but that's, we had the snowstorm. So some of those crash numbers are, are slipping slides because of the snowstorm. Then the February, you see where the numbers are there and where we really wanted to get them. I'd like to get them down to zero, but you know that's probably not going to happen. COVID strikes in latter part of March, and our numbers start creeping back up again. So same time last year, we were sitting at 394, and this year we're at 396. So we're on track to be above what we had last year, uh, which was the highest year by far. Maybe not by much, but maybe just a little bit. Uh, on the back of that handout, you've got that map. Uh, the dots really don't make any sense because they're all clustered together. <laughs> I uh, tried to do them by color, but it really didn't help much. So, but it it does bring to the forefront the the point we've been making about the, the turnabouts and trying to concentrate our enforcement efforts on those and those intersections, and about what we're showing having a presence there, because that seems to be our our biggest issue currently with crashes. A question, Go ahead. Mr. Mayor, can I ask? Go ahead. Um, would you, this is very good data right here. This kind of sort of, it, I don't want to say it proves, but it kind of brings attention to the particular thought that we had. And that being said, would you have this in a soft copy that you could email to me? Because yes. I'd like to use that information in a letter to DOT. No, it's not saying that this is the only factor but it is something that I'd, I'd like for them to consider. Because the thing is, we go from 2015, 400 to, let's just say 600. You don't know about a 33% increase from that period of time. And there's one right. contributing factor. There may, be, may have been growth in Union County, but it is the opening of the street. It is street. what it is. Exactly. And I've, me and the manager have conferred briefly about this, and I'm, this is just pulling data from my system, dispatch system. This is not state data that we're kind of meeting. I won't say we're meeting resistance, but it's being very hard to pull our county data out of the state system. So from that, and the information from the actual incident reports without having to wait for the yearly report from DOT to be published, yep. if that makes sense. Yep. So this is just dispatch data. This is no injury data, no calls data, and just plotting the positions along 74, yep. if that makes sense. Yep. But I understand what you're saying, and I'm, I'm trying to work toward that, toward getting some solid numbers together for you. Appreciate that. Um, the only other thing I have for you tonight, one of the uh, council members asked me to speak briefly about the Katie Flag uh, missing person from Branding Oaks. Um, wanted to let you know that um, currently all, all leads that we're getting are being followed up on, almost instantaneously as they come in. They're being assigned to an investigator and they're running those tracks. Um, but they're just, there's nothing coming in is basically what it boils down to. 
Um, nothing has developed out of any of the leads thus far or any information that was developed uh, during or right after the disappearance that made us think that any foul play was involved in it whatsoever. Um, but I wanted to reassure you that this case is still being actively worked um, and it will continue to be worked until she's located. Um, and that's kind of where we stand on that. But I'd be glad to answer any other questions you may have. I have a couple. Um, on the uh, on your 2020 study, um, how much more traffic, or is there more traffic that goes on 74 compared to the once it opened up as a super street? Is there is there double the traffic? Is there to me it appears to be a lot more traffic on that road. <clears throat> it's kind of like if you're uh, if if you play. 100 baseball games and compare it to 200 baseball games, your statistics may look like that you're going to have a lot more strikeouts or home runs or whatever, but you got to compare it apple to apple. So hitting, is there – is 300 compared to 150. So yeah. I understand – the opening of the bypass in what, the latter part, I can't remember exactly when, 18 or 19, early 19, uh, and that was to attribute – the lessening of the traffic on 74 and was supposed to take a lot of that traffic out. Now, all hours of the day, the bypass stays busy. And there is a large number, especially commercial motor vehicles that are traveling that bypass. Has my personal opinion is I am not seeing a decrease in traffic or the traffic accidents that I would have thought would have happened when the bypass opened. Uh, travel time. Now, you, some depending on the time of day or the time of night, travel times may go down coming through Indian Trail, but if that hot couple hours between lunchtime and seven, eight o'clock, it's it's rough. Well, last question is: is how much of the newness of it, and what I mean by, you know, you hear a lot of complaints about the the U turns and people not understanding how to turn in those lanes and. I did it today, and people still don't know what how, how, yeah. how to turn on those lanes. I, I know you've got to expect that. That's probably where you run into most of your your accidents anyway. A, a, am I correct to say that or not? I hate to speak out of school and tell you that's a contrib a large contributing factor is because it was initially, um, but you still have to bear in the part of the inattention, the not paying any attention at all and just and then the not knowing what they're supposed to do in those lanes especially at the triple when you're talking Indian Trail Fairview and the double on Union Indian Trail and they're coming off of that off of that side street on to 74 and if you pull out of the middle lane and transfer lanes you're looking broadside at a car traveling westbound on 74 or eastbound on 74. All right and I just wanted to get that because has it been a year? And it could be more than a year. I don't even remember. It, it, I, th I think as as the news this wears off, hopefully the the accidents will start to slowing down a little bit. Maybe not, but m maybe you have to wait another year or so to see the true the tr the true statistics. Well, one one thing we found though, you know, away from the intersection, you'll see on that map, that plot map, there's a lot of crashes that are away from the intersections in between them. Our we're having trouble getting the speeds down just on the enforcement side. That has helped. When you see these crash reduction numbers, getting those speeds down on 74 east and westbound helped tremendously. And just that presence of slowing those cars down, it is not uncommon, and I've, I've told you all this before, 80, 90 miles an hour in broad daylight is not uncommon on 74. Not uncommon. I've got guys writing them every day. So, and you can write this one and two more go by you while you're stopped with this one. So, and it's a, it's a repetitive factor. So I'm, ho I'm really hoping that once we get this grant in place mm -hmm. next week and get those two guys up to speed to increase our traffic presence on 74, that you'll start seeing those, those numbers drop in speed and then the crashes will kind of coincide with that. Yep. Thank you. All right.
Mike. Uh, <clears throat> Captain, the, um, one of the things I think I remember about the super streets was the, uh, the reduction in severity. Are you seeing that? Is, do you have any numbers? That... I hate to give you that off the top of my head because I don't. Not with not not without looking at it, you know. Okay. The um, I, I'd hate I'd hate to give no you problem. try to give you something. But I can I swear, that's one one thing I'm looking for is trying to get injury stats that bear off of that state data without having to pull individual reports and look through this you know every report to try to find a cause right. and then what the injuries were. Okay. Well, that's it. Have a good night. Thank you very much, Thank you. Thanks, Captain. That brings us to the consent agenda. If there's no questions, I need a motion to approve. So moved. Mr. McIntyre has made the motion to approve. All in favor? That would be unanimous. Well, we lost one. Mr. Bob is okay? Yeah. He'll return. He's okay? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, he'll be back. That brings us to, I'm going to open up the public hearing for the Economic Development Incentive Grant Hearing. <clears throat> and uh, invite Mr. Platte to the um, podium. And uh, he has a brief PowerPoint. Good evening. Um, thank you so much. It's a, a true honor to be here. Um, Mayor, Council, Manager McLaren, um, want to uh, bring before you tonight a, uh, a consideration of an incentive grant for the Town Center project. And uh, if you uh, just bear with us, we'll do a little bit of uh, history here. Uh, Commissioner Cohen, I know you have not seen this in closed session where we have discussed this with the other members. Um, the Indian Trail Town Center uh, is a three-part uh, mixed-use development uh, that really is going to be a catalyst for, the, for downtown. Uh, the project will incorporate uh, residential, single-family units, as well as a retail and commercial office area. Um, to create this project uh, to its entirety, the developer will need to improve the site, including the water, water infrastructure in the area and some road improvements. Uh, to create proper pressure and capacity to help serve the, the project, specifically the commercial side of the project, um, and to provide, again, that fire protection and other uh, useful water uh, supply that's needed. And that'll also support the residents, not only a part of this project, but throughout the entire area. Um, the water pressure is adequate uh, to satisfy the residential components within this development, but not the commercial piece. And so, uh, that is what we're, um, is part of the, the monies to go into this to help support that infrastructure development there. Uh, once the site enhancements are uh, complete, it will enable uh, not only the project to go forward um, for the retail and commercial side, but also um, really help develop that whole uh, epicenter node that the town has envisioned for the area. Uh, and again, while there is some residential that's um, in the area as part of what they're being what is being developed Indian Trail is only incentivizing the industrial or excuse me the commercial retail component of the project and that is the same Union County is also contributing to this and so same thing it is only incentivizing the footprint associated with the commercial development what I'm really proud about is this is the first time that uh, the town and the county has uh, jointly participated in a project of this kind and uh, really, kind of looking back, I think it's, I don't think any other municipality has worked with the county on a project like this. So it's, it's a good groundbreaking uh, project. So thank you for working with us on it. Um, if you look at the area there, it's right along um, the Indian Trail Road South. Um, and so the area to your right um, is the residential component. The part in the yellow is what we're talking about tonight. And that is the commercial retail component. Uh, the nice thing is this is that epicenter, that whole area that will help uh, and get impacted by this and new, uh, a new tax base will really develop as this is that catalyst to redevelop that area. If you look at the area, uh, the part that is in the colored in green is, your, um, is the project that we're talking about. It's roughly $30 million within that footprint of new buildings. 
and then you're looking at potential upfit of up to $15 million within the walls of those buildings. We are only incentivizing the shells. So that $30 million is what this project is, is based on. It's looking at about 160,000 square feet, and based on that calculation of per square foot, the number of jobs created within that window, it's approximately 175 jobs that'll be created there. So, and you look at that mix, there will be some retail jobs, which may be not on the higher end payment, but the office jobs and other things will be substantial. So if you look at the, um, the area, you do have the 252 apartment units, the 100 townhomes that'll be developed, and then the commercial project. Looking at the values that sit on the entire site, that's what you're looking at. But again, focused on the green, you're looking at 30 million on the low end of what we're talking about in the development there for the town. Uh, upwards of 40 or 45 million when you talk about full build out of the structures themselves. So the incentive part that we'd like to talk about with you is basically the town's commitment to the project is half a million dollars. And that goes toward to the developer to help with the site development and the infrastructure coming to the site. Um, they will be paid uh, on the commencement of the project, project in four monthly installments. Um, the town is only, again, incentivizing the retail and commercial portion of the project. I want to make sure that that is, that is understood. And we're not incentivizing a specific retailer. It's the development that the retailer could go into. Um, it has been stated by the developer that without this incentive, um, by both the town and the county, both at their amounts contributing, the developer could not uh, create this retail commercial development project. Um, the residential portion, again, is coming regardless, so um, we're not uh, talking about that, and it can still be satisfied with just a pump system in the existing um, available infrastructure in the area. So, but there are, there are residents around this area that absolutely have no fire protection right now through their uh, fire hydrants. So again, we, with every incentive that we put forward, we do a cost benefit. We look at your cost and what it, um, the, all the, the things that the town has to put toward uh, a project and supporting it. Um, that with the residents that come with this, the jobs that come with it, there's, also, there's a cost as well as the benefit to that. So we try to run those numbers as best we can. Looking at it, uh, this project scores extremely well. So over a 10 year grant period, you get a 7.13 to one on the cost benefit. So basically for every dollar the town is investing in this project, and it is an investment, you're getting $7.13 back over that time period in the 10 years. Over the lifetime of the project is 14 to one. Substantial. So normally our incentives that we take to the county are two to four. So this gives you an idea of the scale of what this project does. Um, so the, the volume of investment compared to the, the cost that it will incur to the system for the town is substantial. So it's a, it definitely is a, a defensible incentive to put forward to the taxpayers because they're actually going to be reaping significant benefits. And that's on just this footprint. That does not count the other benefits that will occur around it in that epicenter. So if you look at it, there's a, a break-even point um, just on the pure tax rate uh, right at uh, 2032. You'll get just over uh, half a million dollars back. But again, that's assuming only 30 million in investment and no other benefit around the area. So again, we try to give to you the most conservative number possible. So typically in all of the incentives that we've done, the cost benefits that we've put together, um, we have exceeded these numbers much earlier. So um, what we try to show again is almost the worst case scenario. So again, we're incentivizing what's in the yellow. Your benefit is gonna be on a much greater scale. And as that develops out over the next 10 to 20 years, uh, you'll see a lot more tax base sitting right there for the citizens, as well as the quality of life that it will bring to the citizens. And on top of that, the public benefit of having adequate fire protection. So, um, and again, we are just to kind of another reminder, we're not incentivizing what's in the red, uh, we're incentivizing what's in the yellow. And again, we're not talking about, but just think about the development that'll occur within the red circle. With that, I'd like to um, bring up Mr. Marcus Arroyo, the Chief Operating Officer for TIPAR, the developer of this project, 
and so he can address any questions that you may have specifically to the development. Thank you. I want to thank all of you guys for sitting down with us uh, tonight and over the course of uh, about three years in, in, in the make into this. We've, uh, you know, we've presented in, in front of in front of the board over the course of the last couple of uh, within the last years. Have worked with the town staff uh, diligently, and they've they've been excellent to work with, as well as board members uh, as well, uh, EDC and the county. Uh, this was a team effort to get to this point, and uh, we really appreciate you guys' consideration to this and, and take this serious uh, uh, as as we move forward with uh, with our plans to to really complement this great town. Uh, we feel great about the the prospects that we're already speaking with. Um, on, on, on the business sector, retailers, as well as uh, business, good business groups that are looking in this area, as you, you all well know. Um, uh, the apartment complex there for uh, Ardmore is moving along very, very smoothly. We, we're seeing uh, really good possibilities of uh, the, the lease up there going a little bit better than what we had projected, um, as well as that we're bringing a national uh, partner to be able to bring in a really, really nice compliment uh, to, the, to the town homes, just to bring a good sector uh, into, into the downtown area as this continues to move forward. Um, we've upped some sizes working with the county, or working with the county public works, we've upped some sizes basically on, on, a, on the line um, to really maximize fire protection in and around this area. Uh, that's been, that's been a, a, a lot of deep, deep detail work, as well as with the state. I um, think we're finally at our final comments to actually be able to move this thing forward and bring it to fruition. Uh, I think we're in our last little leg of that. So um, I, I'm here to answer any questions uh, that any anybody here may have regarding the project and, and the status of uh, where everything's at. Mike, do you have any questions? Marcus? No. David? I do, and I, I don't want to be, because I, I don't, I'm not as familiar with you get, uh, of what what they're doing but the only thing that and and I like it I like the I've always liked that this is the downtown project we've been talking about since I'm, how many years 10 years or more when did when did it first when it's, was uh, the first 06 was 06, it 06 07 basically so, first yeah cuz I, I, that's 14 years ago yeah yeah so I've been waiting on it yeah but, but that's what there there in turns my question. There's so many things in the town that that we've approved up here over the years that never get built. I mean, I, there's still not, I mean, the the one thing I think you need to really look out for is to prove something like this. When are when are you going to start? Do when are you actually going to start building it? And not like so many other things, uh, get it approved and then just stall. Uh, yeah. that sit there sit, nothing yeah. happens yeah that that's a great question and there's there's a lot, a lot of intangibles that do create that um, we've we've been able to work with the county with the town uh, and with the state to try to maneuver through some of those uh, um, obstacles that big projects like this can overcome and we have we still have them in front of us we're still working with the town and and, and, and the state with uh, regarding the roads and, and to improve that we had a, about a sixty thousand uh, dollar uh, uh, TIA study basically that was done that's basically about, probably about 14 months worth of work there to try to really help intersections and, and problems that are that great at, as an F today and to try to bring that up to a C possibly a B with with some of the uh, major road, road improvement projects and some of the surrounding projects that are that are in the making and, and CDOT, um, I know, is they're working through some of those things, but we've been working with uh, with all of them as well as the town. Um, as of right now, we have uh, a, two really good businesses that want to come now, and uh, we want to go ahead and get those properties and and those pads ready as we speak now. So as we're look into uh, we're doing all the site work we still have to submit our, our final submittal to to within the town go through our approvals there and um, but we can see this going into 2000, 2000 early 2020 uh, 21 excuse me 2021 to start go, to possibly going vertical with some of these uh these buildings that'd be great that, yeah. that'd be great to see some progress finally get yeah get started i'm, I'm and this this will be just to answer a little bit i'm going to give you a little, little 
be very clear, you know, this is not a big rush uh, to build all, you know, 100, 200,000 square feet of office retail all in one spot. It's, it, we, we do have to ma make sure we maneuver within a four or five year period to be able to accomplish that. But that's, that, that should be the proper growth in order to, to fulfill some of the road improvements that do have to come to fruition. So we'll work together in that, in that as well. Thank you. Yep. Yeah. Sure. I'm good. Okay. Um, I'll open up the public comments portion of it. There's two that wish to have spoke. Uh, Mayor, yes. just one quick comment to, um, in relation to your question, to to protect the taxpayer. There is that in the agreement that has to be among commen commencement of the project. That the no payment will be made, and so then there's also some some if they do not commit or do not do what they said they're going to do there is a clawback to get that money back. I apologize I didn't mention that, so that there are some things to protect. Incentives are very important to us. We want to make sure that we you know, use them appropriately and, and have protection for the taxpayer because it is their investment. The other thing is in the cost benefit, we did put in that schedule of time that that investment would occur so that what he's talking about is that development uh, is already uh, captured in that cost benefit too so that you're comfortable with that as well. Thank you, Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you for that. Aaron Cunningham. There's no public comment. So after the, after, let's take the, and then we'll take a quick one. All right. Um, all right. So at this time, we'll close the public comment. Um, I have to read this into record. Oh, okay. Yes. Um, council, can we please uh, excuse Mr. Barber from the meeting? Yeah. I'll show this to you. Okay. Sure. We need so, a vote. Yeah, I just need a consensus so that he's not automatically counted as a yes vote on everything. So okay. uh, I'll make a motion to exclude Mr. Barber from the rest of okay. the meeting. All in favor? Okay. Thank you. All right. Um, all right. Now, um, the draft EDI agreement is complete with regard to the terms stated within the draft agreement. However, because the final agreement must, agreement must completely align with that of Union County, certain exhibits have not yet been added. The exhibits will be added to the EDI agreement once they have been provided by Union County. So I'll need a motion verbatim as on your agenda. I'll, I'll go ahead and make that motion unless somebody else wants to take it. All right. Um, I'll make a motion to approve the Economic Development Incentive EDI grant to be awarded to the Town Center, Pro, Town Center LLC in the amount of $500,000 subject to the terms of the draft EDI agreement as presented and to authorize the town manager and town attorney to finalize the agreement with the, the, with the addition of exhibits that align with Union County and are referred to but absent from the draft agreement. Mr. McIntyre has made the motion. All in favor? Motion carries unanimously. At this time, we're going to take a three minute break, please. Call this meeting back to order. Yep, we'll call this meeting back to order. And that brings us to new um, old business, agency donation for the Queen City Honor Flight, which was presented last week. Does council have uh, any input or a motion or anything? Well, I mean, um, I wouldn't mind making a motion to, to donate a little bit of money. Um, I'm thinking, you know, $1,000 or 2000 We have four, I believe. And we're early into, yep. the, into the budget, I mean, into the... The new year, sure. so one or two, whatever you prefer. One thousand is okay. With you. Um, David, one thousand okay with you? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. I want to get it's this on recording, right? You did hear Jerry say, I did, yeah, give a thousand. Mm -hmm. I know it's yeah. okay. okay. Mark this date. <laughs> um. <laughs> Yeah, I'd like to make a, a motion. There's um, enough space between us if lightning strikes. <laughs> <laughs> to, um, to authorize the town to donate $1,000 to the Queen City Honor Flight as a donation. Okay. Like to make that as a motion, please. Is there any, com any um, 
conversation? Nope, we're going to take it real quick. Okay. Um, <laughs> Mr. Morse made the motion to give $1,000 to Queen City Honor Flight. All in favor? Approved unanimously. <coughs> Brings us new business, appointment of board members. We have what appears to be three open seats for the Board of Adjustment. Is that correct? Okay. And there's one applicant. And uh, unlike me, he can't be, have body parts put into three different seats. So um, there's one applicant. Anyone care to have a conversation or make a motion to appoint someone? I make a motion to appoint Austin Yao to the Board of Adjustment. Is there any conversation on the matter? Okay, Mr. Um, Cohen's made the motion to appoint Mr. Yao to Mayor, the board of adjustment. May I interrupt? Yes. Um, can we pick a seat? There's three vacant. Oh, pick a seat, terms. yes. Uh, seat five. Seat five. five. Wait a minute. Yeah, that's the longest running seat. Yeah, that, that'll be. Yeah, we'll just hook them for an extra year. Okay. Um, Mr. Yao to seat five. Thank you for noticing that. Um, all in favor? Motion, uh, uh, motion carries unanimously. That brings us to the appointment to the planning board. There is one seat, seat four, uh, which is, expires 6-3 of 22, with two applicants. I have a suggestion, if I may, if raise, raise my hand. And, and Yes, you may. Uh, I suggest Larry Dukes, if is, I understand maybe you're. I know Larry, and uh, I've known them for many years. He'd be a good selection. Oh. You remember we were at a, you know, we, we, we knew. Mm-hmm. Okay. Council? Mike, uh, he's made the suggestions? I'm fine with that. Yeah. Okay. You can make a motion. motion. Make a motion for Larry Dukes for seat four. Mr. Cohen's made a motion for Larry Dukes. Uh, for Larry Duke for planning board. Yeah. Planning board seat four. All in favor? Motion carries unanimously. That brings us to transportation update from Mr. Hunsinger. Okay. See, now would have been a good time for a break. Then. Side is wrong to yes. Delayed. Delayed. <laughs> delayed, delayed, delayed. Uh. I guess I need to start running from my office to get here. <laughs> uh, Mayor, Council, uh, I've got some uh, good news and I've got some bad news for you today. Um, and hopefully we can end it with some good news. Um, uh, update on Sardis Roundabout. Uh, the, uh, they basically have all the paving done on the, uh, now we're talking about just the traffic, you know, the, the through lane, which is the L line. We're trying to get that open first and then miscellaneous items like, uh, you know, shoulder work and stuff like that will still be going on. But uh, right now we're just trying to get to open the traffic. So what they've done right now is they've got all the paving done. Now they're putting in the um, refugees, uh, refugee islands uh, around the roundabout itself. Uh, we got concrete that still has to be poured around the, the circle uh, itself. And then they're actually going to start pre-marking, striping probably tomorrow or the next day. And then the striping guys will come later on this week. If the rain holds off, which last I checked, it looks like it may not rain this uh, in the week. We may actually do a final uh, pre-walk call a pre-walk through just again just to get that portion of the project uh, opened up to traffic. If we can get that done, uh, best case we could get it open this weekend. If not, it may worst case cause of the rain. It could wait till you know Monday, Tuesday next week, possibly Wednesday. So uh, that's the uh, that's the gold, and so we're we're shooting for that. Any questions about that project? Is that <clears throat> good news or is is that the bad That's the good news. news. That's the good news. That's the good news. All right. Come on. Okay. Yeah, I have one question. We finally got to the finish line. When do you think you'll actually com have it completed in its entirety? <sighs> I'm going to say it's probably going to be another two weeks after the after this week. All right. But at least traffic can pass, which is, you know. Exactly, yeah. I mean, at least people will be stuff. actually get to use the, the, yeah. the road itself. So that's a good thing. All right. Uh, Any more questions? Yeah, yes. Um, I know there was a lot of a lot of complaints when um, I think it was due to open last Saturday. I think it was. Last and, Friday, yeah. Yeah, and, and and at that Friday, um, we 
they sent out the delay until the 30th. Mm -hmm. um, is there any better communication that we can get out of them? Um, everybody, was, including me, because I'm out that way, was thinking, okay, yeah. Saturday I get, get my road back. Yeah, we we try to hold off to about that Wednesday of that week to, to see if they really could push to get that open. And again, they're the contractors; uh, they have to figure out how to get this best done. We can't control that, and unfortunately, you know, it just didn't happen. So, again, communication-wise, I mean, at this point, there's not really if we get it open. So it's it's really. Uh, I, I guess what I'm saying is if we know that there might be a delay, yeah. I, I'd almost believe it would be better to go ahead and say, you know, uh, a couple days before, hey, it's going to be postponed. If we make that date, then we're, we're all that much better. Yeah, and I asked them a couple, on a couple occasions, you know, are you, you sure? Are you sure? Like when the date was slow to get in here and they kept saying the 12th. And so, you know, all I can do is go by what they're saying, and unfortunately it didn't happen. All right. Next up, um, uh, just give you a brief update on the Omer Road project that is a uh, 4714B, which is our section of the project. Uh, again, really no surprise because the DOT's uh, uh, struggles with uh, funds right now. Uh, they've pushed this for another two years, um, which really they were supposed to start right away in May of this year. And of course, you know, COVID happened, and so really they're they're shooting for fun, you know, right away to start back up next year, fiscal fiscal year 21. So they realized that utility wise, it's probably going to push. They were trying to do it one year. I think it's, they said basically they think it's going to take two years. So now they pushed the project pretty much two years just for the fact that they feel the right of way and the utility work is going to take that long. So you, now you've got right away <clears throat> right away at 2021 to 2023 and then you have construction from 2024 to I'm going to say 2027 uh, assuming it's a three-year project. NCDOT on these type of projects they don't put a they don't come up with a schedule uh, on the on a, a big size project like this they basically uh, they set these contracts as more of an incentive type contract so I mean you could get a uh, example you could get an A plus contract and pick, maybe could build it in two years but if you don't get the A plus contractor, you know, it could take three to four. So it's really a hit and miss. Uh, so conservative, I would say four years, but they could get it built in three. So you're, again, in, in date 2027. Uh, they have pushed back our, uh, as you see on the step, you, you see the million dollars every year the town has to contribute. So they, they basically have, uh, they've updated the step because back then, obviously, the old step showed the uh, 10 million dollar contribution so they've now corrected mm -hmm. that and if you look on the step you'll see it's starting at next year and a year a million the million dollars comes every year any questions on that yes yeah. i do yeah i well jerry let's let, i'll let you go first and i'll i'll come after all right we've given them a million correct and that was going to be tied to um right away acquisition this year and now i'm hearing right away acquisition is being pushed back by two years Correct. And they're expecting so start next year. payments in those two years? Well, they, well, yeah, I mean, they, they expect to, to be paid, yes. Uh, unfortunately, the way the agreement works, uh, they don't have, I mean, we don't have to uh, give that payment if they're not showing progress, in my opinion. Yes. So, um, can we go ahead? This question's already been yielded to Karen, who's going to look through the contract and get better clarification okay. for us, and then come back to council with those specific answers, not to put Todd in this precarious situation. No, I mean, no. the agreement is what the agreement says. So it basically states that we have to pay a certain fiscal year. Now, that agreement has changed now because of COVID, so Karen could say we need to do a new agreement because it's technically not correct now because project's been pushed date wise so so I think certainly you, she can answer that at a later date okay. absolutely yeah. yeah so she'll clarify that yeah. also with the other powers to be so nobody gives misinformation or well but I'm um, sorry I I think it was also a good question to ask and to clarify because 
you and I were on that same meeting where they were talking about the road being pushed and based on the information you have taught. So now Karen is charged with providing counsel with that appropriate information because for us, it is raising some red flags in terms of giving money and there's no performance mm -hmm. really being done or what they've agreed to do. So, I mean, you know, citizens watching at home would understand that we're, we, as the council, we are registering our displeasure with the DOT on that particular project as we've committed um, in writing town funds, citizens' funds, towards the construction. And since 2011, this hasn't happened yet. So I think it was a good question, but Karen will come back and clarify it for us. Mr. Mayor. Mike. One of the things I want to share with the board when we get to the manager's report, we're going to ask for a workshop on October 13th at 530. One of the things we want to talk to the board about is Old Monroe Road. So we do have time to talk about the situation and what are the options available to this board, plus give Karen a week or so to research the contract. And we'll also talk about Indian Trail Road and what you want to do about that. Yep. Thank you. And I would add one more thing. The way the agreement works is it's based on right away. Well, the way the STIP works is right away is just the next two years. So now they've shown on the STIP right away two years, the other three million is in construction. So again, the agreement is changed based on the STIP. So that's what Karen needs to kind of get clarified. Any other questions about that project? Mike. No. All right. I wanted to uh, brief, you know, I'll go by this as quick as I can because I know it's, this meeting, <laughs> meeting has ran a little late. Um, we're trying to wrap up our land development manual, and, and really it's just a technical manual, and all we're doing is really updating standards that are obviously gotten old between the last manual, which was in 08. So uh, I'm not going to bore you with details with standards stuff. Again, it's really just updating the standards. The one thing I do need guidance on from the council is roadway widths, and meaning, you know, you get a subdivision coming in here at a workshop or whatever you want to call it, and uh, you get to look at that plan at the beginning, and you, again, the questions start coming up about on-street parking, or is these roads wide enough, and so forth and so on. Well, I've talk with uh, Captain James about this. Obviously, the Sheriff's Department is, uh, you know, them and our code enforcement are big uh, departments that need need to, you know, enforce this on-street parking. So they've run into, you know, I'm not going to say issues, but again, we have standard of roads out there that's been out there for years that obviously don't comply with our ordinance. So we went back and forth. Well, what we want to do moving ahead is build roads wide enough to where, you know, we, we, we thought the mindset of shrinking the roads to prevent only no on-street parking for new subdivisions. But I think that ideology is, has basically changed. And so Captain James and I have talked and, you know, Captain James feels like the roads should be wider. I think some of the council members probably would agree with that. And so I, I need y'all to start thinking about that. And maybe at the next council meeting, you know, we kind of clarify what do we want as a town. Now, I've got some examples. Again, our specs right now is 18 foot to 24 foot wide roads. Now, not, call, not commercial. I'm just talking about subdivisions. Now, you do have to collect a road that comes in the main subdivision that sometimes is wider than 18 to 24, but that is just a short stretch. Most of these roads are 24 to 18. You cannot own street park on 18 feet roads, but you can on 24. So uh, what I think the, the council wants, and you tell me if you agree or disagree, is two prime examples. One is Annandale. Annandale has two roads that are 32 feet wide, and I'm not saying go 32 feet wide. My suggestion would be compromise and go around 28 feet, just for a reason for maintenance in, in the future, and the fact that the manual is going to build a better road. Our, our standards right now are not what the standards should be. And so the developers have built roads better than our manual, knowing that our manual is subpar. But the new manual will build better roads, which will be more expensive. So I'm trying to make a compromise between the widths and um, the, uh, the structure of the roadway. Um, 
again, two rows, 32, the rest of them are 24. So you can pretty much on street park in anywhere in Annadale. And so example of a 32 foot wide road, this is what looks like a 32 foot wide road with cars parked on both sides. You got plenty of space. Fire truck is only nine feet wide. It's, well, anyway, they, they need 16 feet, but again, the, the fire truck itself, nine to 10 feet wide. So you got plenty of room. Again, that's 32 feet wide. That's a, that's a lot of pavement, but if that's what you want, I'm, I'm happy to move forward with that. Can, can now, I ask, go ahead. Sorry, can I ask a question, Mr. Mayor, yeah. if you don't mind? Um, so I live in Annandale, yeah. and the Basketball Hope is actually my house there. Um, <clears throat> so this particular street, Mm -hmm. There's usually cars on both sides. Yeah. I'm fortunate enough that I have a clear garage, so I park in the garage. But there's a street coming up on your right there, um, just by the silver vehicle, the silver mm -hmm. truck. That street is Dunbarton. If people are parked on both sides of the street, you can't get through. No, and, that's, you, and it's and illegal to do that on a 24 hour You have to stagger. Right, park. And and so the question that I'm having is, while this 32 street does well yeah um the the neighborhoods or um covenant said you should not have no on street parking no commercial vehicles that type of thing how do we address it in terms of based on what you're asking of us yeah. how do we address where everybody has to either park on one side or park in their garage how, how do we address that because the thing is, it's, you, we don't want court enforcement having to do a lot of work or the sheriffs coming out there, but how do we, what, what's the suggestion there? Well, from, you know, discussions, again, between the engineering department and, and the sheriff's department is it really needs to start with the, um, the, the covenants of the neighborhood. And when, they, and when these developers start writing the covenants to, to hand over to these people, they need to put that kind of language. I mean, if you're going to designate one street to be one-sided parking, it needs to start there. That way everybody has an understanding. We, we, we are not going to go in there and try to do that because that's just going to be a nightmare for the town to deal with and, and to enforce. And so that, to me, doesn't work. Uh, another example is the next slide. That's, there's Terrapin. There's your other street in Annadale. That's a 24-foot wide. Unfortunately, I couldn't get a picture. Kind of see in the distance. There might be two, but it was a commercial vehicle, so that's not really – it's a temporary thing, not sitting there all day. But, you know, again, plenty of, plenty of room to get by. As long as they, they don't park beside each other, obviously. Um, but uh, so another example, Fieldstone Farms, which is right beside Annadale. I mean, those roads, they're all, they're the back, same thing. That loop you see right there is 32 feet wide, and then you, all your internal streets are 24. So to me, good compromise. Uh, here's examples of what it looks like. All right, again, plenty of road width. Uh, I, I don't, I'm not advocating 32 feet wide roads, but that's what it would look like. Uh, and that's what it's going to encourage people to do that is a wider road. So if you shrink it a little bit, I think that at least encourage them to, encourage them to park, you know, closer to the curb and, and everything else. And these folks obviously did that, but you don't get that ever so often. And then 24 foot, again, this guy parked at the, along the curb, that's what you, how you should park. Give as enough room as possible, but of course that doesn't always happen. So we want to be kind of uh, cut and dry with this manual. I don't want to give 18, 24, 30 foot type um, uh, leeway when we start talking to these developers before they come to you. Staff needs to say, look, we want either all 28 foot wide roads or we want 32 and then 24 foot local internal local roads. However it works, it's fine with me, but we, we kind of, or do we want to shrink them and not allow on street parking whatsoever? Um, I don't think that's the, the way to go because I think it's just too many, too many issues with that. So, again, the recommendation would be 28, maybe 30 feet, and then, you know, compromise on cul-de-sacs, maybe do the 24 on cul-de-sacs, or just do 28 feet everywhere. I mean, it's really, it's really the guidance I need to, to get this manual finished. I have a question for you, Todd. Um, when we were talking about repaving, you said that there was a preference or something about a type of equipment to pave the roads. 
um, because of the seam or something? What yeah, is, I mean, it's, diff it's yeah, it's difficult for a, a paving outfit to to uh, pave a 30 foot wide road because most pavers don't reach 14 feet wide. And so they basically, because of our resurfacing contract, we make them do one seam joint roadway, which is what that is right there, or one seam joint in the middle. So they have to pretty much rent an extender or rent a whole new pavement, which, you know, it's, it's just up to them. Uh, that's how, uh, basically, that's how the specs work. And so we don't want three paths of paving because that's just two extra jo an extra joint in there that will, it's going to get water infiltrating into it. It's going to ruin the pavement down the road. So uh, that's why 32 feet gets extreme, you know, because you uh, it's very hard to pave that the way we, the town wants these roads paved. And so I think we're, we're, we're going to build better roads. We're going to make developers build better roads. So I think... That in that instance, we're not going to have to maintain these roads as, as bad as we are now with the poor uh, structure that's on these old roads. So would 28 feet be adequate for on-street parking? Yeah, again, if, if they don't park right beside each other, I, I think it's fine. I mean, that's that's the only downside is, uh, you, you're again, you're still going to get a uh, seven-foot wide car, 14, you know, you still got a 14-foot path in, down the center. That's fairly decent. It's not 16 feet, obviously, but we, again, it's a rare occasion that cars park right, right beside each other uh, along a street. It's, it's not happening very, very often. Uh, <laughs> all new subdivisions. These, we're talking about new subdivisions now. We're not going to talk about these old ones now. This is new standards. So I think, I think it's a good compromise. But again, we can totally go 30 feet and just have, have it like that as well. Okay. So food for thought, and then I'll get back with you next council meeting. Thank you, Todd. All right. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, would yeah. you like us to calendar this for action October 13th? Yes. Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, that brings us to uh, the solicitation ordinance. Oh. Hi, Brandy. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Over the last several months, many of our subdivisions have been inundated with solicitors selling a wide variety of products and or services. Uh, many of the solicitors have been very aggressive, have made full, uh, residents feel uncomfortable, and even been fraudulent. Um, the planning department has been working with um, Captain James and our town attorney, Ms. Walter, to draft an ordinance that will address this issue. Um, attached you have within your packet a proposed ordinance that permits solicitation only by permit with several requirements, those of which include posting a bond, completing a background investigation, and fingerprinting. This ordinance will allow our Union County Sheriff's Office division the ability to respond to residents calling with concerns. Um, you do have before you tonight, um, separate from your agenda, a revised version of the proposed ordinance as recommended by the town attorney. Those revisions are just simply to section 11401A and 11402A1, both ending those sentences with the language without a permit. So that ties the bottom two sections to the, the first two sections. I've experienced in other jurisdictions this type of ordinance helps separate those that wish to do legitimate business within our town from those that wish to scam our residents. We, after we saw the need for this ordinance, um, I had drafted uh, this, we had drafted this ordinance and scheduled it for tonight's meeting. I actually received a call from a citizen um, on this issue. So you'll see within your packet tonight that um, she's attached an email just in support of this ordinance. And we're here to um, answer any questions you may have. Thank you for your consideration. Any questions? Yeah, Pretty cut I have a few, yeah. Okay. So what's the problem? I mean, I had a solicitor come to my door. They said uh, they're trying to peddle something in a bottle. I said, not interested. Slammed the door and said, you can leave now. And Sure. So, again, we've had some, um, w without this code language, our sheriff's department has a hard time running off those that are fraudulent. Um, we've had, uh, an, I know, an incident of a solar company that came in um, that was fraudulent. 
And we also have, um, I mean, I've personally experienced some of them are so pushy that, you know, you say you're going to call the sheriff's department and, and they're literally trying to find their way in, into your door. Um, so we have seen a lot of traffic um, on Nextdoor and other social media outlets where people have, um, have experienced things that have made them very uncomfortable. Um, to be honest with you, there was actually a video, you know, that showed one of the gentlemen coming up, you know, attempting to sell something and swipe the top of the door frame, you know, maybe looking for a spare key. Um, so there, there was a lot of interaction that we saw, um, and then I saw firsthand, you know, personal experience that it matched up with the concerns of those residents as well. But Captain James can speak more directly from his side. That'd be great. You know, we're, especially with the way business are now with COVID and people being at home during the day, you're seeing more of where kids are being home alone during the day. And we're getting calls every day about suspicious vehicles. Somebody knocking on the door or walking around the house, something like that. And a lot of it is, and I, I don't want to put this particular business and give it a bad name, but roofing, for instance roofing contractors that are looking for work, they're riding down the street looking for a bad, you know, something on a roof, they knock on your door, they demand the money, part of the money up front, and they're gone. You never see them again because they're wanting the money to buy, the, they'll tell them to buy what they need to fix the roof. And they'll write them a check, and this happens a lot to senior citizens. They never see them again. And we don't have any luck in finding them because they weren't left with an invoice or a bill of sale or anything else. It's just a guy coming to fix my roof. So we're trying, I think if, after Ms. Walter looked at this and, and with Brandy, I think this is pr probably one of the stiffest ones I've ever seen, especially with the bond. Right. And that gives us some teeth in, the be in being able to charge and at least knowing who we've got walking the streets out here. And they're actually seeking business. Yeah, I saw that bond number, and it was very high. It seemed to be, you know, quite high. Um, and the permitting fees to to go solicit, and I think it was, what, for seven days? And then you could get it renewed or something to that That's effect? Right. I don't know. It just seems like it's, it's a slap in the face of capitalism to me. Um, folks going out there trying to, you know, encourage you to give me your money for a product that I have. Um, but you, I know you have hucksters and fraudsters and all that. And, it just seems to, I don't know, I just, I struggled with that when I, when I have a good answer for those kind of people when they show up to my door. When I'm, and one thing I find, it just like you said about slamming a door in somebody's face, where I have a problem with explain, explaining to my 80-year-old mom and hang the phone up on somebody when she's getting ready to give her credit card number out. And they wipe a complete bank account out yeah. in one swipe and trying to convince them that it's okay to be rude to people. And they do not, they don't understand that because that's not the way they were brought up. Same thing with opening a door to somebody. A lot of them, you'd be surprised, probably still have the doors unlocked and get walked in on. But the same thing, we're not trying to, what I call the young capitalists is the kids walking around with school trying to sell the candy bars, mm -hmm. things of that, things of that sort. That's, this is not to affect that at all. This is purely to try to turn the ill ill intent away from the community here. Are, do we have any other neighboring municipalities that have this type of program or ordinances that? Most do, and a lot of these, um, the fraudulent folks look for the towns that don't have one because they know they can't get run out. Okay. So um, most towns do have a peddler's ordinance. Yeah, I'd just like to hopefully if we do you know, do this ordinance that we make it um, friendly for the honest folks and as unfriendly for the, the crooks. Um, it's just, that's my concern. Over yeah, and, and Mike's been what I've heard, and this is all hearsay from um, other, experience, other towns' experiences, but what you do get is legitimate businesses. They will actually call the town, say, we are doing a, you know, um, a lot of times it's an alarm system or some legitimate company will call town hall, say we're coming, what do you need from us? And they'll go through the permitting process, they will you know, have alerted the police that they're coming and the town can put out notices or whatever, but they do come and do the legitimate and they expect to be um, 
subjected to some um, rules around around their permits. And so you'll it, it sort of separates the wheat from the chaff on the good versus the the legitimate versus the maybe not so legitimate. And you support this as? Oh yes, sir, definitely. Department. Okay, thanks. Let's come. Um, I, I, I've, I know we have an attorney, but I, I argue the legality of it. To be honest with you, I don't, I don't, uh, I don't understand how you can let a somebody come sell a candy bar at your door or Girl Scout cookies. And and I want to, I, I just want to explain myself without getting too deep in into this. I read all this stuff. I, I see all the door to door stuff, and I'll be honest with you. That's how I got started in this world is going door to door. And it, as a door to door salesperson, it, if, if you can do it and be successful, you, you can do anything. Honest to God, you can. And uh, a lot of these people that I see complaining, and I don't, don't mean this in a bad way, um, are complaining and are mad because somebody walks up and they knock on their door. Now, you can slam the door into somebody's face, but for, I want to finish what I'm saying. The, I've heard and seen people complain. Uh, we had a guy come by our house not too long ago and uh, knocked on the door. I heard about it, read about it on next door. And uh, when somebody knocks on my door, I have a tendency to want to buy something from them. I, I do. I, I don't care what they sell. I, I'm going to buy it. So I said, come on, let's sit down on the front porch and tell me what you got. And he had cameras, you know, and first he said it didn't cost anything. And and of course, I got him something to eat, and I got him something to drink, and you know, he he got all. So we we, we had a good time. We said, but his story that he led off with was not the story that that he he did. One thing people call and they complain so much. They say, "I'm going to call." I read about this. I'm going to call his boss tonight or tomorrow, the company, and tell him he was out here at nine o'clock at night knocking on my door, and that, that he, you know, he was pushy. Well, if you call his boss and tell him that he was pushy and he was at your door at 9 o'clock at night, he's going to get a raise the next day because he's doing basically what he's been asked to do, and he's going to be good at what he does. He, he, he does. People got to realize that the reason he comes late at, later on in the afternoon is because people aren't home during the day. They, they come home after work, so he's out working. He's out supporting a family. He's out. There's a lot of good people that, you know, we all, us old people remember the door-to-door -door vacuum cleaner salesman. They come out and vacuum the house. And, and, and Jerry, I understand what you're saying. But, uh, there are a lot of good people that do this, that get it ruined by some of the, some of the bad people that, that go out. So if, and I'll sum this up as quickly as I can. I really believe that you're going you're gonna to fend away people, and I almost hate to see this done, but I, I, I could support the fact that if you make them get a permit, if you simply made somebody get a permit, the, the bad people aren't going to do it. They're, they're, they're not. They're just not going to do it if they're out there ripping people off. But to charge a legitimate person some a, a high fee to come by, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't get that. I, I, I don't like that. I, I, and I just don't think it's fair. But a, a permit I could see, but maybe not a not this high fee to get an honest man who goes door to door and works. Hey, listen, it, it's not probably what he wants to do, but it may be the only way he makes a living or can make a living. So, well, that, that that's my clarification. Question. It's not permit and bond per person. It's permit and bond per company. That's exactly. correct. And if I may just quickly respond, um, we, we are very familiar with folks that just like to complain to complain. Um, there have been some real serious, you know, security. People have felt uncomfortable. Um, one thing I have uh, to recommend that may help with this is that the seven-day period, you know, could be extended for six months or a year. Um, but the, you know, the $5,000 bond, you know, you go get a bond, you might get charged 10% or something. A legitimate business, that's not that's not a big concern, but being that it only is good for seven days is is a little intense, so maybe, you know, expanding um, the time frame, but this is not time sensitive, so we could certainly take a step back and, and you know, get some more feedback from, from council. And I understand. I understand that pushy people coming to your door and 
and I do. I, I know it's a problem, and people complain. I read about it all the time. People complaining about it, and I'm I'm not saying that they don't have a legitimate complaint. I'm just saying so, sometimes people just don't like the fact that somebody knocks on their door, and you can be polite to people and say, you know, I'm not interested, or or hey, you know, whatever, and, and people can walk off, and and they will. They'll they'll walk off. It's actually his job to walk up and knock on your door and make you say no three times because you're taught, you're actually taught when you walk up to the door that when they say no, they're not interested. They mean K-N-O-W. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> to ask me more, you know, tell, tell me more. So that's actually what they're doing, and, and, and they'll, they'll leave. You know, but anyway, done. I'm done. No. I would agree for you, David. Um... When you got started, there was some ethics in this business, but I've witnessed sheriff's cars. I've witnessed door-to-door -door salesmen throwing things at people that have said no and throwing them through their windows. I've seen it up and down my street on camera as in videos. Um, I don't necessarily fault the door-to-door -door, door -door salesmen. I fault the let's hire 500 people and let the one or two good ones stick to the wall. The rest we're not held responsible for because they're independent contractors, they're going door to door to make a living, and it doesn't matter what they do, they're the ones being courted off, caught off in a, hauled off in a police car, and they didn't work for us, they were an independent contractor. Meanwhile, the company's still making the money. I say we need to hold these companies responsible for who they're hiring and make sure that they hire pe more people like you instead of the, let's see who sticks to the wall, and let's see who gets arrested. And the ones that don't get arrested this week will make it to next week. Um, I think maybe the bond's a bit exp excessive, and you can extend the days for a bond, but um, something needs to be done because we don't have the ethical door-to-door -door salesman we had before. We have children left at home, um, and we have known people that will stick their foot in the door and not let you close the door, and if you have children in the house, that becomes, a safe. we don't have the same people we had 10 and 20 years ago. And did you have something to say, Marcus? I would like to offer an opinion. Actually. Go ahead. Um, so I, I understand the points that Jerry made from you know free market economy, giving people the opportunity. But the thing is, people pay money to live at their homes. They live at their homes. They deserve some sort of privacy. I, I do understand that people do come and sell stuff. I had a guy trying to sell me an alarm system that I actually had in my house at that time from his same company and he refused to listen to, to what I had to say and he realized that I was getting impatient and you don't want to get me angry so he walked away. But the point is, whether it's women or men, people do sometimes feel intimidated by some of these people. Now, there are legitimate businesses that come out there that will probably offer a service to um, homeowners that they may be interested in. But the thing is, um, you do have some people that may not necessarily be operating um, on the up and up. And uh, Ms. Dees, you mentioned that we could, maybe we, we look at possibly lowering the fee and or the time period for that. I think those two things are appropriate and I don't know if the council will sort of give instruction for that. And we could probably, probably take that up at the next meeting in terms of uh, refinement of that particular item after we've discussed it here. But um, I am not necessarily opposed to that, um, adding that language. But um, as the mayor said, I think David mentioned it as well, and I think Jerry did, the, the fee and, and the length of time is something that we could probably look to extend. Um, but Karen, from a legal standpoint, we'll, we'll look for your input on that. I don't know, Mr. McLaurin, you looks like you wanted to add something. Well, I, I, I tend to <clears throat> agree with with Marcus um, and and the mayor um, that I think we have to do something to protect um, our citizens. <clears throat> it's and look, I grew up when uh, the milkman, the the produce. I mean, but times have changed, unfortunately, and and. Uh, 
I think that uh, the proposal that we have is, is a good one. I just think we need to tweak it a little bit to make it uh, more acceptable to the to the the true salesman, but still be a hindrance to those that are not the true salesman. So, Mr. Mayor. Yes, sir. Um, let us suggest that we pull this and recalendar it to the second meeting in October, not the next meeting, but the one after that, and that give us some time to work on it, and reach out to the individual <clears throat> council members. Council member Barber is not here, and you may have some thoughts that we haven't thought about. I have not talked to Brandy. I've talked to the captain. I think he's good with it. Brandy, would you and Karen be good with doing it? Okay, council, okay with that? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yeah. If I may quick too, just um, this actually, this type of an ordinance ha is covered by um, uh, General Statute 160A-178, and everything that is in this ordinance is expressly permitted by state statute. It's just on the legal side, so I did want to clarify that. Okay. So. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. All right, that brings us to Approval of funds transfer. Ms. McLaurin or Mr. Wadowitz, did you want to feel that? No. Nope. Oh, did I miss the alarm? Oh, yeah. the alarm ordinance, excuse me. Good evening, Council and Mayor. Um, before you is just a small uh, change to the alarm ordinance that I would like your consideration on. Um, what we'd like to do is instead of calculating excessive alarms on a cumulative basis over an entire year. We'd like to be able to start those over monthly. Um, it's, it's a more friendly practice for our businesses so that we're starting them over. They get two free each month as opposed to two free or two false alarms each year. <clears throat> so I'll take any questions. Anyone? Um do have a question sure. or a comment. So I, I took the liberty of Googling alarm ordinances just around, and this one seems highly restrictive when you go to, or let me, let me rephrase that. I had to get a clarification from the town manager. This one looks like it's loosening up the rules quite a bunch. Um, so you have three per year right now, alarms. Then you go into the false alarm fines and all that. Correct. Now you're potentially saying you can have 24 false alarms a year. Correct. So what does that do to the again, to the homeowner that's sitting behind a commercial place like myself that used to listen to an alarm go off every weekend for hours and hours and hours. So now they're going to get a break so twice a month that, that that can happen and they won't get fined until they happen to hit it that third time that month and then it resets the next month. I don't think that's fair to the homeowners that have to endure that. And that's you know, just um, a comment from myself. And I, and I don't see any other municipalities with this loose, this looseness of having 24 false alarms with no penalty to at all. It just seems excessive. That's okay. my comments. I, I agree with Jerry, but w I'm just curious, why, why would we do this? Why are we, I mean, there's gotta be a reason. So. Yeah. Right, so in application, whenever we've been administering this, um, I particularly have been involved or overseeing it for the past like year and a half as far as the alarm, the false alarm ordinance. And, you know, we've, um, we've got some businesses um, and especially those that are uh, employing younger staff and it may be a fluid staff. So they're rotating and sometimes they, they just have issues with the staff not understanding how to turn the alarms off or to maintain those. Um, and what we've found is uh, even if they do get two, those folks who are getting two are likely getting more than two in a month's period anyway. Um, just this year so far, we've, we've fined $6,600 in false alarms, and that's just for July and August um, <clears throat> because we, we do these a month out, so we get our report from the, the sheriff's department a month out. And so we were just trying to – go ahead. Do, do they turn the alarm off before you go out? Is that, I mean, in other words, alarm goes off. If, if I own a business and I have and, and it goes off, you try to get that thing or, or you can, is there a communication that you don't have to come out for? 
And then, they, therefore, is the fine done through the sheriff's department? Is that how that works? No. We we process that fine. It's through our ordinance. So how do you know about the alarm? So they provide. Through, yeah, they provide us the okay. um, so the report monthly. Right. Yes, gotcha. sir. Yes, sir. What happens if the call once the alarm is dispatched, the alarm company will contact the keyholder first. They can cancel us from response from that point. If they do that. Then you, still, they never know about it. It still shows up on a report, but it tells her that it's canceled. She doesn't bill for that, and it doesn't count against them as long as we don't respond. If I put a car on scene, that's when it counts. So it actually could be more than more. It could be could be oh, quite that, a yes, bit sir. more. If, yes. If, 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 okay. Just uh, real quick on that. Jerry makes a good point. Sure. Um, you make a good point mm -hmm. because at least – once a month, I used to set my alarm off by accident, but I was able to rekey it in, um, and um, shut it off. And most kind, most times, the alarm shut off pretty quickly. The alarm company calls. I'm an employee. They call the boss. They, they'll shut the alarm off regardless. Nowadays, right? Um, is there not something in place for? an alarm that's excessively, I haven't heard them in years. Alarms go off excessively like they used to. I remember in the news a few years back, there was a house alarm that went off for like three or four straight days. Finally, they got a, they were able to get something to get them to cut the power to the house. Um, the people were on vacation. But um, for something that's like an alarm that's going off for hours and hours and hours, that doesn't happen anymore, does it? I mean, you'll be out there and then you'll be able to call someone to shut that alarm off, correct? I don't want to say it doesn't happen because we have, we have a lot of trouble getting keyholder information. And especially when you're talking about businesses, the, the keyholder may change from month to month. And then what happens is that we sit on scene for two hours waiting on a keyholder to get there when we find an open door waiting on somebody to come secure the building. That's where we start running into time. But then when that repetitive, because there's a bird in a warehouse or, and it sits there and it goes off continuously for an hour, because they don't, the alarm company doesn't have anybody to call other than, you know, who they've got on file. And if they don't reach one of those numbers, you don't have anybody responding. Okay. All right. That makes sense. Okay. That, that's really all I had on that. Uh, Mike? I think, Gary, the, the issue you're having, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but what we call, when I was with CPD, the audible alarms, when they go off and they just go off. That was one of the examples that I used, but I'm thinking about the sheriff's department being out there 24 times and us paying for that, and there's no, no recouping any fee or fine or anything because they're getting free, free passes. And it's just kind of all, you know, when I pull it together, I just kind of have an issue with it. Can I expediate it, and why don't yes. we just talk about it? Is five times enough? Is five, would that be better, five times a year? or Or... You, or is that too many? I, I don't know. You're, what, do you, what do you think, Alicia? I mean, I'm, I'm happy to obviously revisit this, and I've talked to Kevin about it, and we've kind of, like I said, over this past year, we've, we've stuck strictly to the ordinance and have, have fined those, and we've had opportunities to discuss with business owners about keeping their key holder information up to date and um, making sure that somebody is available if the alarm goes off so that we are um, circumventing them from having to, to respond to the false alarm call. So the ordinance does work and we can, we can look at re how we reset it. I just felt like two over an entire year was not it's, it's, it's difficult to administer, and it's also not as business friendly as just trying to give some grace there. Um, and, it, and 24, if 24 is not acceptable, we can definitely go back and tweak that number. How much so we're how much right is, now, it's two. Two. Yeah. So once you hit three, and let's just say you have two in January, and then you have 12 months before that resets. And so for me, that didn't seem very fair. And that was why I was trying mm -hmm. to find another way to continue obviously enforcing our ordinance, but make it more business friendly. We you don't know, typically have these issues with residential. That's, that's it's normally business. I, I've had an alarm like that. And you know what, once you set it off twice, you don't set it off a third time. You right. try not to because <laughs> it really makes you not want to set it off yeah. again. And, every, and you make everybody aware. 
don't set this alarm off again because right. if it is, we're going to pay. And what is the, what is, I'm sure it goes up each time. It does. Right? So um, you one and two are zero, obviously. Those are, those are given right now. Three through five are $50 per occurrence. And then six and seven is $100 per occurrence. Eight and nine is $250 per occurrence. And then once you hit that 10 plus, it's $500 per occurrence. So if you have a really bad month at the beginning of the year and just one or two each month thereafter could cost you $500 each um, if you have a bad month. If you have an alarm system that is malfunctioning and you get eight in the first month of the year, you have an entire year before you you get reset to two false alarms again. Well, once you get, get charged $500 a time, you just leave your doors open. And we, I mean, the ones that we see a lot of repeat um, with would be a lot of fast food restaurants. Again, because they have, um, you know, their staff changes more frequently than, than other businesses just because of their ebb and flow of business and, and, and their, their age ranges are sometimes younger. It's just a, a wider range for those businesses. Mr. Morris has suggested six times a year. Okay, that, that sounds good to me. I don't, I mean, what do y'all think? Well, it, it's, we're putting the burden on the Sheriff's Department. Mm -hmm. That's that's the thing. Um, we thought we we're just taking it off. I mean, we went from twenty. We went from two, two to twenty-four, back down to six. It doesn't stop them from responding. Like right. they would still respond. This is more on the the, um, the fining of after they've responded yeah, to we're gonna respond the false right. alarms. They're going right. to respond. But like but you said, regardless. when you hit them in the pocketbook, hopefully that's going to slow it down. It does. It does. And so it does. That, that's that's where I was going with this. Is that. You think it's more of a deterrent, right? Yeah, yeah, I agree. Yeah. So, um, would would we need to table that? Or are you guys okay with six? Or how how I is that how is that going to work? Keep what table and everything? Yeah. Why don't why don't we make well, a well, decision? Well, then let me ask this question: How is this going to work? The first six they get three. I mean, no, I would. It would. So we want to look at a time period when we want to start that over because these fees are already set in our fee schedule. Whenever the budget was adopted, these fees were already set. So right. um, in order to change that structure, we would also need to change the fee schedule. Um, so what we're looking at is the time frame. So yeah. it could be two every six months or two every three months or however you wanted to, to reset that or we can leave it at two annually. I do have one more question. Sure. Um, is there a billing component to this that's causing it, it to, you know, to be an issue? No, we, I mean, we, we bill it through the accounting system. Uh, we bill it through our accounting software. So, um, that, so that's, that that's comes not out an of, issue. No, so sir. it's strictly just the it's, number of calls before they get- It is the um, number of calls. Um, being able to track it, it's just a little bit more timely whenever you have to go back and look at a business's false alarms over a year's period as opposed to maybe a smaller period to look at mm -hmm. um, administration-wise, like administering the actual ordinance itself. But billing, we can handle the billing through the accounting system. Okay, so make, can I make a suggestion then? Because this is, this is real simple. Since it's basically tracking uh, in the reset period, it's, it, was two, it was two per year? Two per year. Why not just two per six months and they could reset the system every six months? Would, would six months be good? In t because the thing is, you still have to go back six months versus going back 12. But it's true. I mean, Mr. Morse mentioned three months. I'm um, sorry, six. All right? Yeah. So six a year. So every, f every, er every four months, two. That gives us six. So in That's quarterly. Getting, we're so getting complicated we now. Yeah. No, it's well, not I got an idea. I, I got an idea. idea. Jerry says six. six. What, what do you say, Mike? <laughs> Just what, what, how many would you like? Two? Two. All right, Mike's one, Mike says two. Marcus, how many do you say? I'm going to six. Well, since you did that, I'll say two then, because I, I agree with Jerry. There we go. So, so we got you six, six, so it takes 12, 13, 14, 16 divided by four, and it's four. How's that? There is you that, go. Is that, that, is that works for me. Is that, is that four a year? How's that? So every six four, months. So no, two, a no. year. The four year is the same as two every six months, which helps, her with her, exactly. which helps her with her, her reset. Oh, is it easier area. to do two it, every six months? Well, we have to do it on, it's, we're looking for the time frame. Okay. So, yeah, okay. two, every two, two every six months is four a year. Yes. Okay. Yeah. How about that? 
All right, I will. I understood um, what you were saying. <laughs> you you realize, but you realize three and four the, can <laughs> get into twelve, right? You, we realize that, right? We realize that. But I understood <laughs> what you For some reason, we struggled with that math right there. Because <laughs> okay. if I said I said three, I said three. <laughs> All right. hey, look, it's, yeah. it's said. Yeah. You don't even it's know. Settled, what okay. You're saying. I'm getting delirious. Oh my god. <laughs> Okay, I will um, make the... Well, we can, you give, can, we can make it on that, and you can okay. change it later so That's we don't fine. have to table it. So resetting it every six months with two free ones every six months, the third one starts your progression of fines. Yes, sir. That's yeah. what the motion would be. I can't make the motion. Well, we need an algebraic equation for that, right? <laughs> I'll make, I'll make, make, make the motion. motion. Four, four per... Uh, so uh, if you could just, um, to amend it, to read, it is hereby oh. found and determined that three or more false alarms within a six-month period is excessive. Yeah. And so then we just we cut the time in half is yeah. what we've done. Yeah. Yeah. Same structure, story. just cut the time in half. You needed to repeat it so you get it. So no, she just made ma it. She I, just, I, I, you'll make the motion? I, I make, yeah, yeah, I'll make that motion. Right there. <laughs> there you <laughs> go. Uh, David just made Alicia's motion. All, uh, all in favor? <laughs> favor? Motion carries unanimously. We're getting delirious up here. <laughs> Thank you. Thank um, you. <laughs> did you want to speak tonight, or did you want to table yourself? <laughs> no, we'll do it next week. We'll do it. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> That's the approval of funds transfer. This should Thank be you. very simple. Yeah. Mm. No, J no, Jerry, that's not your paycheck. No, I, it isn't. No, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> Good evening, Doug. Uh, just briefly, um, before you was our NCCMT, which is a great investment for the town. Um, but uh, as you can see on this first one, that $747 is the interest for the month. So I went running into Mike. I said, Mike, something doesn't sound right. So that's actually six one hundredths of 1%. So uh, Mike said, get on it. So we, we um, surveyed five banks five local banks and uh, First National Bank <clears throat> on uh, East Independence is offering 0.65 or 65 one hundredths um, on a money market. So we'd, uh, we got the LGC approval for the bank. So we'd like to transfer $12 million out um, and get 10 times the interest. And I, and I take that part of my job seriously. We have the funds, and the one behind it is four one hundredths of one percent. So this is our general fund balance. Um, and again, it's a safe investment, protected with insurance and collateralization, <clears throat> and we wanted to bring that before you. Okay, so and number, so transferring it out to get ten times the amount, so going from basically seven hundred to seven thousand. And that, that would be well, that 700 would be annualized out to about 9,000 a year, and uh, at the 0.65 would be about $78,000 a year. Okay, does that tie the funds up? No, a it's a money market. Okay. That was good question. question. Good question. So, question for you um, you're asking for the transfer of 12, right? Yes, 12 million? but then the 7 million, what, what's that associated with in the back? That's still on the NCCMT. We wanted to keep money available in oh, case so we you, needed it. You're still keeping that there? Yes. That's just for information purposes. Yeah, there's 20 million mark, of which we're going to move 12. Okay, basically. great. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? And NCCMT is a great investment. They've been great. They're great to deal with, but they're tied to the Treasury. And he said they may, nothing may happen for six months. So I couldn't see that earning $700 a month on $13 million. Glad you told me that because I wanted to know how much I was going to make when I retired on my 13 million each month. So, yeah, appreciate that. so I'll make the motion to approve the funds transfer of $12 million in invested funds funds from the NCCMT to the First National Bank. Thank you, Mike. Mr. Heads made the motion. All in favor? That was unanimous. That brings us to your manager's report. I'm going to step up here because I don't know that my mic is projecting. Uh, this is my, what, second meeting, and I, I'm enjoying working with this board. Y'all have great discussions from door-to-door uh, -door salespeople to alarms. <laughs> I'm going to have fun here. Uh, you see on the agenda where the ABC board has, me uh, has changed their meeting date, I guess, to tomorrow night, 
and um, council member Cohen can tell you anything you need to know about that I also put together a memo uh, that's at your desk I won't go into all the details but you see the the key dates for the park and rec master plan we are also I have for you a resolution that came from a Lumberton City Council member about proposing hands-free um, driving take a look at that just follow up with me in the next couple of days if that's something you want to take up uh, we're also looking at surplusing some soccer goals uh, there's a process we have to go through and we should have that process done next week uh, excuse me by your meeting on the 13th and um, October 13th I've already mentioned the workshop at 530 and also some policies we want to bring to you for updating uh, last but not least October 24th is the holiday celebration for the town. Uh, I think they may still be looking for volunteers, but if you haven't volunteered, uh, just get in touch with the Park and Rec Department. They'll be in two-hour blocks, 9, 11, 1, and 3, and I know some of you have told me how much you're looking forward to that. It will be a little bit different. I think it's more of a drive-through this year. And that's all I've got. Okay, that brings us to council comments. Ah, um, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to volunteer all day for that. And since Marcus has been so gracious to say he'll lend me a hand for anything, I assume he's volunteering for the whole day too. No speak English. <laughs> <laughs> you deserve that one. <laughs> no habla inglés, senor. Oh, okay, I hear you. All right, no, thanks everyone for everything tonight. Great meeting, great council. Captain James, thank you. Um, I have nothing else to add. Everybody have a good few weeks and God bless. Mr. McIntyre. Thank you. Um, good meeting. Um, it was good to see the residents come out tonight and, and bring uh, their issues to the council. Um, I wanna say that serving here with all of you, um, you do take this very seriously and when you know, citizens comes with come with complaints um, or you know just things that that are um, pressing to them that we do take them seriously and everybody's involved. So um, as we go forward, the manager will keep you informed as to um, what he and staff what they're going to put together and hopefully we can get that resolved. Um, staff, always a pleasure working with you guys. Thank you for all that you do. We do appreciate it. Miss Queen, always pleasure you helping me out, keeping me you know, informed of certain things. Um, and council, enjoy it. Mr. Cohen, I can see why the, why the mayor put you there that way. You gotta keep him on track. Sometimes he needs a helping hand, so help him out. But thank oh, you, everybody have a good night. You had to get the last word, didn't you? <laughs> Mr. Cohn. I just wanna be brief. I just wanted to understand, I didn't know you had met my wife, um, Mike, because you had mentioned the hands-free driving, she's been driving hands-free for years. So, and I didn't, I didn't know that. But uh, you're not going to survive the night. I'm just kidding. <laughs> but anyway, I just, uh, it's good to be here. And again, thanks for the people coming out tonight. And uh, uh, it's good to be back. Mr. Head. I appreciate everybody attending. I'm, I'm really glad to see the uh, downtown development, uh, economic development getting started. Um, I think that's going to be a, um, can't, uh, hopefully I can be around to see that uh, come to fruition because I think that's really going to be a good start for uh, having a, a business economic development right in the middle of our downtown. So I think it's really something that's going to set us apart from, from others. Thanks for everybody coming. And Mr. Morse. Uh, everyone have a good night and good night. All right, on that note, I need a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Mr. McIntyre's made the motion to adjourn. All in favor? Meeting adjourned. <laughs>